Helen, are you satisfied? Well, they are awfully loud, but uh, the children do seem to be enjoying themselves. I don't suppose there's any real harm to them. Well, you know, every generation had their own music. Remember the Lindy Hop? Oh, my ear. Don't embarrass me. <laughs> Let's just jump into this business, and then we'll uh, we'll congratulate each other on an awesome show afterwards. <laughs> How can we go wrong? The subject matter alone. I know. Hello, and welcome to Hello, This is the Doomed Show. Folks, I am Richard. I have managed to pick up not only a tantalizing special guest co-host, but I have managed to get the most sexual talker and it has been so long since he's been on the show that he's never been on the show before other than i think you sent us a voicemail of course the man i'm talking to is court psyops of cinema psyops podcast hello court me not being on the show is not for a lack of trying i just want everyone to know like i've been i've been gently goosing richard and trying to talk him into it but you were you were afraid of what i might say and or (laughs) Or what movies I might be discussing with you and like what jabs I might, you know, send certain places because, uh, let's face it, um, I'm kind of an asshole sometimes when it comes to things. I'm very what? opinionated. Yeah, I'm very opinionated. This is news to me, brother. <laughs> right. You know, and also, you know, there's a lot of grievances I have to air towards Hello, This is the Doom Show. I've been a listener <laughs> since the very early days when you used to speakerphone brad in next to the recorder so that you could record brad and yourself at the same time classic yeah like i've been listening that long like to the point where there are times when i have heard you say no one listens to this anymore and i've literally just looked at my phone that i'm playing the podcast on going wait yes i do I actually go back that far, like to when you guys were setting yourselves up as like a sister podcast to the Nashi cast where you guys were like contacting back and forth. Because at the time there were, there's like a handful of folks that were doing these Euro horror flicks, but like you guys were kind of the ones that were delving into like, like the more weirder different stuff. And because Nashi cast was handling most of the Spanish horror that you guys also loved, you guys kind of started veering off towards, you know, some of the some of the offshoots of that stuff and kind of cross pollinating. And those discussions were like some of my favorite stuff you guys have done. But when I said air grievances, I meant geek out like a fan, (laughs) by the way, we were so tied in to an ashy cast as like sister show friends, fans, whatever. Now they don't return our calls, but <laughs> like we didn't do a Nashy movie, like a Paul Nashy movie for like nine years, like yeah. eight or nine years. We, and of course, Jeffrey and I went for the most obvious choice theory of the Wolfman, which <laughs> we thought was a great tribute since uh, Paul Nashy hated that movie. <laughs> Well, that's the most Jeffrey movie that Paul Nashie has ever done, (laughs) except for maybe Tomb of the Werewolf, but that might be a little too porn for him. I can't. Oh, there's nothing too porn for Jeffrey. (laughs) No, the last time we actually talked on a a podcast, I guested on y'all's show on on, uh, frickin' Cinema PsyOps because I needed to talk about, uh, speaking of grievances, I needed to talk about my parents watching uh, 10 to Midnight 
at me uh, with me when I was seven years old. <laughs> Yeah, and the uh, full R-rated version that yes. you, you would get, like uh, <laughs> on on the screen. Your parents have a history of inappropriate viewing, and and grandparents too, because didn't you, your grandpa and you were like hard bodies fans, or yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was uh, told you I've been listening he, that long. <laughs> oh my God, bless you. He really <laughs> thought I was asleep. He really thought I was asleep. It wasn't like one of those, hey kid, I'm going to teach you about how the world works and it's hard bodies <laughs> but uh no he thought i was asleep it was great the uh the one that i was thinking about today because somebody was tweeting about it uh they were like oh man the sex scene in terminator was so embarrassing watching that with my parents and i'm like yeah try the hair pie scene from revenge of the nerds i was <laughs> not i was nine years old and my mom is trying to cover my eyes and i'm like i don't even want to be here <laughs> forget forget covering my eyes. I just want to jump out the window. You know, it's no wonder that sexual topics, whenever they pop up in film, make you uncomfortable Ooh. when you're podcasting. You have all this baggage with it of like I do. Of like sex being very prevalent and exposure to sex being prevalent with your parents in the same room. That's gotta scar you, dude. They were very liberal with the sex comedies, thus turning me into a neuter as I got older. <laughs> well, to be fair to you. A lot of the sex comedies from the 80s and 90s, if you are a human being with any kind of empathy, will probably make you be like, no, if that's what sex is, I don't want yeah. it. <laughs> Got consent, not an 80s movie. Right, right. And so much so that it's something that, you know, rightfully so gets called out now in a, a lot of ways, even though people can go back and enjoy the films for what they were at the time, which is very much a snapshot of society's ideals. You do some of the stuff that the guys in, like, ski school do. I guarantee you, you are going to jail for assault. <laughs> zapped. Yeah. Yeah, Using zapped. Using powers for evil. Oh, Jesus Christ. Zapped is like like the mandrel from the comics, which is this guy who has mental powers and uses it to sexually abuse people. Yikes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's yeah, that, that kind of stuff. So it's, like I said, I have been listening that long, and I never Thank gotten you. a chance to, like, Thank geek you. out like a fan. And that's why I wanted to do the bring your own cinematic trauma stuff on my show is so I could start you know, coaxing podcasters to kind of talk about the exact same kind of thing that we just discussed here, like these weird moments, because anytime you see that same movie that something like that gets pinned to you, you you definitely will always remember that. Like, I don't think that if Hard Bodies comes on late night cable when you're flipping through the channels, if that's even a thing anymore, or you just happen <laughs> to see the poster for Hard Bodies because it gets recommended because of something else that you're watching. It's probably all Tubi now. Like every like kids are just surfing Tubi or uh, surfing freaking uh, Roku channel, like looking for dirty movies. But there's no accidental finding anything. No, no, it's not like it used to be. But yeah, like you you go through, and I, I think there's like a roulette button that Netflix added to try and give the channel surfing feel. You know, but nice. I, I I don't know if any other streamers have done that. But like that kind of thing where you just happen to catch something and. So much of our love of movies, I really feel, has to do with seeing it at the right moment with the right circumstances. And if you can get this concoction of things together to get the good chemicals released in your brain that make you feel mm -hmm. good, remembering that and then reliving that and using that movie as like a sense memory touchstone thing is a very big part of being the film fanatic that you are. And I mean, there's even more evidence, I would say, for film collectors like ourselves, the tactile feeling of being able to physically hold a copy of something that you love is something that never goes away. Like, I, I got digital files of movies that I, I love, and I would like to have them in another format, but this is the only way that I can get them. Uh, for instance, again, back to showing how much of a fan I am, Haunting of Julia, that episode that you and Brad did, that Holy crap, totally dude. fucking fell in love with that movie. I bought a digital copy of that on Amazon um, from a seller, and then the rights went away, so that was no longer mine. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but hey, it's it's now it's on Haunting of Julia, yeah. at the time of this recording, is on frickin' Shudder, which our pal Scott of EuroCultAV.com theorizes that that means could be getting a blu-ray soon i bought that digital copy because that was the only way that i could get my hands on it and then when it got taken away from me then i got it again through nefarious means but now it's back on shutter and because it's back on shutter or it's on a streaming site where they will somewhat get some money or at least some licensing is paid for it to be there then i, I make sure that i view it there that's kind of how it works but 
the main thing that feels the best is being able to hold a physical copy. And I don't know if that has anything to do with, for me, back in the old school days where you would have to physically grab a tape that was, you know, wound up and or, and or rewound or not rewound, depending upon how you got your hands on it. Uh, some video stores, they were never rewound no matter what they said. And no one was kind. Uh, or or a, a laser disc or C. What was it? CED, I think it was the capacitance electronic disc. Yep. Yeah. Or just something like a physical media format, the feeling of being able to hold that thing and just look at it. And then that alone sometimes triggers those same sense memories. Like is that tactile thing where you can add another layer, like every copy of a movie I have has some kind of a memory tied to it for me that I can instantly access just by literally picking up that copy. You know, of the well, time you know, that I watched it, you know, that that's kind of awesome. This movie that you picked has a very tactile sensation because <laughs> the freaking uh, the VHS was one of those badass ventriculated covers. Is that how that's pronounced? Well, I know that it was puffy, right? There's a couple of them. They had a puffy was version. A shiny one. Yeah, I thought they had a ventriculated one. Kind of like what um, Jack Frost, the Revenge of the Mutant Killer Snowman did, where it would change oh, whenever snap. you moved it. But they did. They had the puffy raised um, embossed. Is that what is that the word I'm looking for? I can't. I think, but, that, I think that's the word you're looking for. I yeah. think because it, it's uh, it's so it's so funny. The one I remember the best was for uh, the dead pit where you'd press the button and the eyes would flash uh, the zombie on the cover. His eyes would flash when you did that. I believe now this could just be my memory being what it is and just wanting it to exist. But I believe that I have seen a standee that was like that for the dead pit. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, that'd be so good. <laughs> and that's one of those movies that I remember, like I kind of knew revisiting it that it was going to be disappointing. And I think that helped me a lot when I've revisited it after, like for the first time in 20 years, like don't get your hopes up because it's not bad at all. It just has a, well, I watched that kind of a tone <laughs> where it's, where it's over and you're like, that happened. I think there's not a lot of things about it that stand out but that's neither here nor there dude court what did you pick what are we talking about black roses <laughs> i can't oh hit the God. high notes like i used to but <laughs> oh man I, I, hey ever since hard bodies and i shaved off my genitals <laughs> no wait i meant blame it on rio and i ironed off my genitals thanks mommy ouch it happens it grows back right <laughs> no S Still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Will be for a while. I do. Yes, Black Roses from 1988, uh, directed by John Fasano. Now, I had heard of this movie before, but it had eluded me, dude. I had no idea how I had never gotten around to Black Roses because I've seen quite a number of this subgenre, which is, of course, the heavy metal horror subgenre. Yeah, we got on this subgenre because we were talking music and pedals yes. and rock and roll and, you know, oh, all yeah. these we'll get different into that. sounds. Yeah, you know, <laughs> Court, Court and I, we, we've probably been, probably have been needing, that was a hard sentence to get out, to talk to each other on a show for a really long time. And sure enough, two guitar gear nerds, although <laughs> our, our nerd specialties are in such interesting subgenres <laughs> that it spurred a conversation of, oh, by the way, we should do a show. And I'm like, pick a movie. <laughs> and uh, Black Roses sounded just right. Yeah, I definitely like vintage uh, recording gear, too. All of my stuff is old school rack mounted stuff that I maintained and fixed. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a tech geek, for that kind of stuff for sure. Nice. And um, my my only analog recording equipment I ever had was a my, my Tascam four track, which uh, I used and abused until it uh, started to make horrible noises, and I sold it for like nothing, and I've never not regretted selling that thing. <laughs> I'm kind of a gear <sighs> hoarder myself, so I totally get that. Oh my god! But anyway, let's before we get to that, let's talk about this freaking movie. I have found a Whoops, I forgot to look this up. Folks, you're listening to me fail in real time. <laughs> I'm looking up the trailer here on YouTube. I'm going to drop... Oh, there's a, there's a four and a half minute trailer. I think I can, I think I can do better than that. Anyway, folks, here's the freaking trailer for Black Roses. I mean, Black Roses! Black Roses! <laughs> Mill Basin is a nice town with good schools. Julie. What did Emerson mean by the Red Slayer? Emerson? 
But trouble's coming to Mill Basin. And this town will never be the same. Turn up the power! Turn up the lights! If rock and roll is the devil's music, then Black Roses is the house band. I mean, last week, all they could think about was midterms. Now it's Black Roses. I love you, Dad. There's something going on in this town, and you gotta help me stop it. Where have you been? Did you go and see that show again after I told you not to? with me to that concert tonight. Now, I can't explain it. I think they're doing something to the kids, controlling their minds. I, I can feel it, Neil. I brought you a present. What the hell is going on here? What you do with my kids? <laughs> the hottest band this side of hell is coming to town, and they're saving your soul a seat. Black Roses. I used the Google machine, unless you have the VHS tape, I was going to read from, I found the British VHS tape on the Googles. I was going to read the plot synopsis from the back of that. I do not have the VHS of this, but that would be a collectible I would want. Just be like, put out the feelers for your birthday. Be like, hey, people, come on. (laughs) Hey, people. Do a GoFundMe for you to get one. I suspect one that isn't trashed is probably pretty expensive. Yeah. So here we go. This is the plot synopsis for Black Roses. When the sleepy town of Mill Basin is invaded by a sleazy band of hard rockers, the self-righteous townspeople try to stop their concert series. Which is confusing. Do bands do series of concerts when they come to town? This one does. Parents and teenagers are pitted against each other as the parents' frantic phobias about the band seem to override all common sense. Only high school teacher Matthew is keeping an open mind. And when the band finally overcome parental objections and perform in Mill Basin, he is the only one who recognizes the music's sinister effect on the kids. Gradually, a town full of normal kids begin to turn bad. Bloodshed, riots, and horrible mass murders assail defenseless Mill Basin. This plot synopsis is too long. This is more like a plot summary. It's like we're going scene by scene almost. I love this. Matthew senses the band's influences to blame. But how? Are they really something else? Something unexpected? Something evil? These guys are wiggity whack. (laughs) Wow, that's from the American Imperial VHS. (laughs) I didn't like that synopsis, but I read it. I can't take it back now. It's a thing that exists that you did. Exactly. Okay, we're going to spoil this whole movie, folks. If you haven't seen Black Roses, go watch it. Um, it is not uh, Black Rain from the following year starring uh, freaking Michael Douglas. <laughs> That's a fact. Even though IMDb might try to redirect you to it when you're looking for it. <laughs> Black Rain? No! Just go watch it before we dig in too deep on this. Exactly. We're going to tell you everything. Also, I like... The one-sentence synopsis on IMDb, I should have read that shit. Demons hypnotize the general public by posing as a rock and roll band. (laughs) Oh, waka waka. (laughs) I think the band came first, and then the power of their rock turned them into demons, but that's my fanfic. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly where the demonization of Black Roses came about, but the Black Roses themselves are actually the the fans, because (laughs) Damien keeps telling everyone they are his Black Roses. Oh, bless him. That they're his children. So is he planting seeds of evil that then generate gothic flowers of beauty? Dude, he's sowing the seeds of love. (laughs) 
I mean, he certainly is in my heart because <laughs> Damien with that crisscross chest piece is oh. just eighties cock rock gold. I, I love his him talking backstage when he has his wig off and it's just like normal short eighties dude hair, and I'm like, what's happening? Anyway, okay. <laughs> yeah, that was excited. very confusing. This opens with some saxophone music. Uh, I want to talk about this score, like not the bands, the the guy who wrote this music is a dude named uh, Elliot Solomon. Solomon? <laughs> Solomon. I shouldn't pronounce it like that. That was weird. But the music in this movie is bonkers. It feels, some of the music in this, all the incidental stuff, it feels like he meant to do more later because it's like this like really strident like synthesizer like going and going but it's just one layer of one keyboard like through most of it and it makes this movie seem really weird and this movie is already weird there's a couple moments in the score where it goes full on early like mind is a terrible thing to taste kind of industrial style Yes. Uh, mu- ministry music like where the scores like that and they very so they very weird. they very clearly were trying to match up like the sort of 80s rock but it's almost like kind of ahead of its time because this flick was like what 88 and yeah. that kind of stuff was really more prevalent ministry didn't really start doing that kind of stuff till like the 90s but that sound wow. very much reminds me of even some of the stuff like that would have ended up on Psalm 69, like those those oh, drum baby. bass programs that they were running for that, you know, the programming yeah. with it. it. It really reminded me of that, particularly at the end, whenever the action kicks up and, you know, it's demons versus English lit teacher. By the way, well, you know, have what, you ever what, seen an English lit teacher that was so respected in a community before? <laughs> this like guy runs like second, this place. He's second only to the mayor. That's so good. He's the consigliere of the mayor. Like he gives the mayor <laughs> tips and the mayor follows him. It's crazy. My guess is that a lot of those bands ended up with this equipment because all these like musician like professional composers they had to get new midi shit like they had to get new stuff so they they pawned all the old shit and that's when all the musicians in the ministry and freaking uh front 242 or whatever bought up all these things at the pawn shop so basically god lives underwater only exists because the guy who scored black roses sold off his <laughs> doctor rhythm <laughs> he created a subgenre. Yeah, Dr. Rhythm's a much later after MIDI came into place, but I get I get what you're saying. Like like that drum machine just so happened to I would like to track the timeline of instruments like that. That would be kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much about this movie that is this weird mix of things and elements and feelings. Most of the way the acting goes and most of the way the drama goes and then the score that we're already talking about that feels like it's done on a keyboard straight keyboard type synth work it all feels very much in tone like an after school special or yes. a very special episode of a comedy where they're still trying to be wacky and funny but it's very serious stuff for me for my money i was like is this pro or anti heavy metal like at the end of the day this movie is about how evil heavy metal is <laughs> That's where it gets that's where it gets really really interesting. If you pull the if you pull the gore and you pull the nudity out of this film yep. and the crazy overt sexuality and you pair it back just enough to where you could make this less of a film that would be more of an exploitative thing that someone like me would be looking for. This film is essentially and you t- fucking nailed it right there the, the nail on the head right there. It is a Christian scare film that they threw gore and tits into. <laughs> Like, that's the tone that I was laying out that I was oh getting at. God. But it feels like, and I know these Christian scare films about heavy metal and the dangers of heavy metal because I have been forced to watch them. Yes. So lucky. Oh. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, watch no. them. I watch them now because they're hilarious to me and it's an entertainment kind of thing, like watching a Reefer Madness scare film. But at a certain age in my childhood, I was forced to go to a Church of the Nazarene on a regular basis. Wow. Uh, this church totally believed the entirety of the hype that this movie is working on on that satanic panic. I feel like it's just taking the stuff that these types of churches would make and subverting it and turning it into a really gross out type horror flick with puppets and monsters and boobs and blood. 
Like, that's what it feels like they're trying to do. And I want to give them the credit to say that that's exactly the tone that they were going for, is they were trying to subvert <laughs> the Christian scare film, kind of like what John Waters would do, you know, where, where they would he would take that sort of style of filmmaking for, like, the nostalgic um, times were better when, you know, 60s beach-type movie that never really existed, that, like, Frankie Avalon kind of world— and then yeah. subvert it and turn it into like hairspray, you know? oh my God. or freaking crybaby. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, or exactly, yeah, like crybaby is an even even further out because hairspray at least was about the actual music and the dancing was like a total love song for that. Where crybaby is totally a subversion of that type of teen drama that existed from that time frame. And I feel like that the filmmakers of Black Roses that was their intention, whether or not it actually is. That's how I take it, because that's what it feels like to me. If I were trying to lampoon those kinds of Christian scare films that were very much this cornball after school special type acting and, you know, scoring and stuff. If I were trying to lampoon that, this is the film that I would make. And that's why I feel like that's what these filmmakers were doing. This so this movie it, it tries to hook you real quick, which it does successfully, obviously. Oh, yeah. It shows you a, a concert. With our uh, our real monsters of rock, our our demons, uh, Damien's demons, rocking out. The crowd's going wild. They're totally obsessed with these guys. And uh, freaking, uh, there's a deranged bellhop at this <laughs> theater watching from the window. And uh, the police come, like the 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 uh, the cops show up, and like we got to stop this concert. And they have to drag this guy away, screaming and uh, kicking and screaming because he wants to finish living life through like a uh a, a one by six freaking window <laughs> well he just needs to catch just a little bit more just a little right. bit more of that show he just needs to see the black roses just a little bit more that's all I'm, that I'm matters glad, to him at this moment i'm glad his pants weren't around his ankles because he was enjoying it a lot <laughs> like a lot a lot well and the cops there, oh, go ahead. there is sequences here at the very beginning where um they are transforming people in the audience like yes. into monsters at with the power of their <laughs> rock and roll. Like their their rat distorted guitars are just going after it and like somehow gnawing off people's faces and turning them into the zombie that gets strapped to the table on Return of the Living Dead. See, I can relate because my band, it transformed the audience into invisible people. They just disappeared on you. That's insane. Yeah, in fact, sometimes they were never there. As we played to the very, very unhappy bartender. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel that. Yeah. It's yes. just like you and the sound guy that just wishes you would get off the stage so he can go hit yes. on the one girl that's at this I, show that just so my, happens to be somebody in the band's girlfriend. <laughs> my only claim to fame a as a musician so far is every time I've been warned, like I have been pulled aside and said, watch out for the sound guy. He's a fucking asshole. And I'm like, okay, sure, sure. And I end up being the favorite person out of the whole night to the sound guy. <laughs> I don't know what it is I do. I thank them for being there. And I'm like really excited that they're not, you know, turning me off, like shutting the power off on the stage, you know, like whatever. I guess they appreciate that. <laughs> I don't know. But I, I always have a good time with the sound guy. I can tell you from my limited experience of working behind the scenes at a club and then also my certainly less limited experience of playing live at shows and things like that most people come in and just treat the sound man like garbage so oh. you recognizing them as a human being and then not having that problem is actually more or less a symptom of you being a decent human being <laughs> <laughs> i mean i still find them intimidating but i'm like i'm not gonna be rude about it <laughs> Rule 101 for anyone that does music out there. If you are talking trash to the head sound guy and you're making his life miserable, I guarantee you that he's going to throw, he or she, they will throw a harmonizer or something <laughs> awful that will make your singer sound like Mickey Mouse on the PA. Or everyone has reverb on really loud for no reason. <laughs> Right. Or for some reason, there is a sustainer pedal that got put into uh, the insert loop of one spe specific track that makes the guitar player constantly feed back. You will have that happen. I have seen sound men do things like that. 
I've had some men ask me to do something like that to go kick on the harmonizer in the the back rack uh, (laughs) because they need to put it on this channel because they are pissed at this singer who threw something at him. Exactly. The makeup on these monsters, like that's going to be the the sound guy's nightmare is, well, you know, being turned into a skeleton. But also... (laughs) These demons, like the makeup on these guys is freaking wonderful. They're they're they can sing and they can gesture and it's like it's it's not like uh Rick Baker freaking stuff, but these effects are pretty great. What it lacks in realism was, and who, trying to be dude, horrifying and scary, freaking, it makes up for in articulation and just general monster mm, greatness. I'm also looking up things in real time. I find it really fascinating specifically talking Alicia about... Alicia Fasano. Creature effects. Here we go. Still there? Still there? You still there? Yeah. yeah. Can you not hear me? Uh-oh. Did I lose you? I, I, I can hear you. You can not no. hear me, though. I can't hear you, brother. How about now? I'm going to hang up and call you back. Call you back. The articulation more than makes up for the lack of grossness or it even being very scary. I think the designs go back to this feels like it was supposed to be a Christian scare film and they were going to show it to kids so they couldn't make the monsters be that horrifying, but they still right. need to just show okay. demon- demonism and, and evil and all of that. And if they are parodying that kind of film and or trying to make a subversive version of that to like kind of show just how ridiculous their fear of this evil is, then you would want the makeup to look like that anyway. But the articulation in the hands for each of the pieces of makeup is incredible. You don't get a lot of when the when the monsters are really pulling their hands and you don't get a lot of that latex bulge out or those little corners that form where the seams actually are where yeah. it becomes like little triangles that'll pop out you don't see that they use the actor's actual fingers or they extend them in a way to where when they're bringing in the claws or those various hands and moving them they actually look like actual hands i don't know if it's fully puppeted or not the puppeteering work in this is surprisingly good well there's a reason there's a, a dude named John Dodds. I'm pretending like I knew this. I did I did just learn about this just now. This dude who's on the crew for this was one it was the special effects director of The Deadly Spawn. Oh my has god, that movie is amazing. fucking amazing. The Deadly Spawn uh, is one of the most underrated, underappreciated and underdiscussed like alien invasion horror flicks of all time like it is so well done and that makes sense because that entire monster is all rod puppetry so they moved on to do this film and my gosh i love them both and i never knew there was a correlation between the effects and you know what the deadly spawn was another creature that didn't look super horrifying it still had a very almost like cutesy monster kind of look to it to to its worm to where you wouldn't be completely terrified by it but it's still absolutely horrifying every time it's on screen and all the nasty shit happens to the humans in that so it's like this mix of kooky and and freaking grotesque but uh arnold i'm gonna butcher this name arnold gargiulo wow i watch a lot of italian films i swear (laughs) this dude also freaking uh worked on the Deadly Spawn, and Day of the Dead. Oh, man, I completely lost my train of thought. Right, so the the makeup, the the puppetry, the reason that looks so great, but I really feel like they dialed back the monsters and they dialed back some of what they, they, they did for the demons and the zombies and all of that kind of stuff because it still is trying to go, or at least it seems to me like it's, it's targeting that demographic. And all of the stuff that basically the more violence, the more sex, and the more nudity that's involved in this film is very much apart from most of the monster work. Yeah. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. They do separate that. So it feels like there could be a different cut of this that they could have tried to sell to, you know, the the Christian scare film folks. The tone of this movie is just bizarre. It feels like three movies. Yeah, it does. It feels it's really strange. These cops kick open the door or this like very official looking dude, maybe the mayor, he kick open the door to see the frickin' rockers and they get bum rushed by a fog machine and frickin' skeleton men. It's wonderful. And then we get the most gorgeous and ridiculously 80s frickin' title sequence. The animated words of black roses with black roses growing like on the screen and some Lamborghinis roll up. And our band 
uh, Damien and his gang get out of fucking Lamborghinis with the crazy doors and everything. It's so great. And I don't know if you noticed or not, when the Lamborghini doors are opening up, they get these like shuttle sounding <laughs> noises that they, they put into the soundtrack. <laughs> did not notice that <laughs> yeah they oh totally do God. particularly particularly the ones in the back whenever like damien stands up and summons them because he gets out first and he like kind of sniffs around the town and like smells like innocence that he can corrupt yes. and then yes. then he like puts up the devil sign in the direction of the other cars and then their doors suddenly open up with that noise that i was talking about <laughs> and then like he like like all the other people there's like there's six total people because there's three ferraris and there's like one person driving, one person riding, because that's all you can fucking fit in a Ferrari. How does a band go on tour with three <laughs> fucking Ferraris, dude? They have a they have this one uh, Lamborghini that's like a freaking uh, like a long um, oh, like a stretch it? limo la- Lamborghini, yeah. <laughs> and that's where all the gear is in. This is like... <laughs> oh, that is just a crime against humanity, cars, and climate change. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, the, the town of Mill Basin is, is ripe for the plucking, and uh, we we immediately get to meet some our hero. You know, I love the misdirection. You think the teenagers, our pals, so we're going to talk about momentarily. Uh, Johnny is it Johnny and Julie? Yeah, I think it's something quite oh pretty much God, that. That so adorable. Yeah. Um, they so you think they're going to be our main people, but oh no, it is uh, Matthew Morehouse, the English teacher. The, the, like like we said, the powerhouse English teacher. <laughs> the man about town who just so happens to be too good for... He's the big fish in the little pond. He's too good for yes. this place. Between the mayor and the governor stands one man, the English teacher. Between the towns, complete and utter destruction <laughs> by the heavy metal band infused children. And the entire world is one man and his Joe. mayor. He's played by John. I had no way to follow that up. That was amazing. Thank you. Uh, he's played by uh, John Martin, who is a, a soap opera dude. He's best known to me, though, as the English teacher in Black Roses. <laughs> yes, I, this is. guy looks so familiar. I'm like, what? He he dude. looks like a cross between Tom Selleck and Magnum PI and the teacher yeah. from Class of 1984. It's like they just basically like. Did this weird 1980s hodgepodge thing, like how they made Lisa in Weird Science, only they made this school teacher. <laughs> much, much better. Good job. Uh, no, I might have seen him on an episode of Columbo. He strikes me as somebody who would have been like one of the, not the killer, but like one of the killer's victims in Murder, She Wrote. Oh, that's a definitive possibility. Yeah. But he def- sadly, no. Yeah, he definitely has one of those kinds of faces where you think you would recognize the guy that helped Buddy Hackett stab himself in the back with a door jam. <laughs> you got some strange. That's a great reference, by the way. Oh, I have seen that episode multiple times. So, <laughs> freaking, um, this movie has a lot of character actors. Uh, the mayor, um, the one who is like sucking up to our teacher, is uh, Ken Swoford. His filmography is 126 credits. Jesus. And he was in all kinds. He was in Murder, She Wrote. Like, uh, he was in 11 episodes of Murder, She Wrote. That's incredible. Yeah, I think there was another, not necessarily heavy metal related horror film, but like kids go bad kind of horror films that this guy was in that I thought I recognized him from. Or maybe I'm just remembering watching Black Roses before I thought I saw it. (laughs) His face reminds me of like he could be the kid brother of... The professor's assistant guy from Evil Dead Two that gets yes. turned into a gets turned into a deadite, particularly yes. whenever he's particularly whenever he's like zombied out or has like the lightning bolt eyeliner drawn across his eye to go to the concert. <laughs> <laughs> he really kind of reminds me of that guy then. So maybe that's what I'm thinking. I don't know, but it's weird. There's so many faces in this specific movie oh that just God. look like other people. Like there's yeah. even a guy that I could have swore was on The Sopranos that's in this movie, dude. That's Vincent Pastore. That's 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 Tony's dad, and the stereotypical Italian father. Yeah, he played uh, Big Pussy Bumpin' Sero in The Sopranos. But yeah, I always forget that he's in this, and I always crazy. forget that Julie Adams is in this. And then I'm always yes. happy to see them both because yes. they really kind of steal the scenes they're in. Yeah, Julie Adams of uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon fame. Uh, she plays a slightly more uptight character than I would have ever expected her to play. <laughs> What's really interesting about it is she's essentially playing 
Dana Carvey's church lady, right? Like that's that's what we're <laughs> yes, seeing her do. That's perfect. Uh, but get, getting back to our, our teacher, he's teaching one of my favorite subjects from English Lit, brother Walt Whitman. Can I just say how much I love that an English literature teacher is given this much respect in this movie? The kids seem to like really like him. Like he's the hip, Dude, cool teacher. They're all about they're to jump on his every word. They're about to jump up on his motherfucking desks and scream, Captain, my captain, Adam. Dude, they're like really into him. They're going to Robin Williams the fuck out of this guy. Yeah, this is dead poet society shit. <laughs> 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 oh my god and i don't blame him no i mean uh, he seems like the kind of teacher that i probably would have had some respect for myself in high school because yes. he tries to talk real to them he tries to teach oh yeah them. like he like really tries to like make them feel like or treat them all like they are already adults and give them a say in the class that's why he does the quorums and things i mean he's even trying to date one of them he's totally like <laughs> treating them like they're grown-ups he is accidentally seducing one of his students no, this watching it with my modern eyes, this feels like this teacher's grooming her and it's kind of gross. All right. All right. I was I was giving him the benefit of the doubt. I'm a very innocent person. <laughs> you can give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm screaming stranger bad touch about this dude <laughs> when it comes to Julie. So he's doing his thing and the kids, like we said, the kids love him. Um, and of course, everyone's giving Julie shit because she has a crush on him and it's very obvious. And after school, we get like this surreal look into the lives of these kids where um, the, the town is very straight laced and this band coming to town, even before we find out that they are actually evil is this town is going to fall apart because a band period is coming to town. Yeah. They're all terrified because the band has this very kitschy satanic thing that you can see that yeah. they all wear black leather at the time, I'm thinking they're winking towards like a Motley Crue kind of thing, because when Motley Crue first started oh, yeah. <laughs> rocking out with their pentagram, like leather straps on their heads or they would have a pentagram and the Shout at the Devil album and everything, there were parents who were legitimately terrified that they were going to bring kids to hell. Like that was a thing that actually happened. And yeah. even though there are other bands that existed far before this that really were much more terrifying and probably really did truly believe <laughs> <laughs> More of the Satanism stuff than Motley Crue. I think Motley Crue is kind of the most popular one that got the most recognition because so many people really love that song, Home Sweet Home. So seeing yes. a dude singing Home Sweet Home with a pentagram fucking bandana tied around or a pentagram like a headband tied around his head like he's Johnny from <laughs> from the Karate Kid. <laughs> you know, like that that terrified people and that sparked all of this stuff that to where this movie came from. And I feel like that's the band that they're hinting at. Right. They certainly have that super 80s trying to do blues riffs, but speeding it up and throwing in very heavy Marshall stack saturation with a rat pedal and, you know, maybe another overdrive tube screamer just to like really exactly. do it. Exactly. The, the way that they're doing the shit with the band, they really are trying to hint at that. But there's some stuff that when they go into the makeup versions of the band and how those songs are being played, that reminds me more of what people should have actually been afraid of, which is like Merciful Fate <laughs> at the time and then King Diamond. Because oh like, I 100% believe King Diamond legitimately believes in the stuff that he sings about. Because yes. he fully 100% portrays that through everything having to do with his life. He does things with a tongue-in-cheek sort of way about him, but if King Diamond were to come to this town and be ready to perform, Julie Andrews would be completely justified to go full Dana Carvey <laughs> church lady on them. You know what I mean? But this is this is Motley Crue coming to town, and it's something that, the fam that these people have never experienced before. So they think, like, Motley Crue is King Diamond, you know? I would even dude. say, like, if Ghost was coming to town, she would be justified. Dude, dude <laughs> you said fear. Julie Andrews, which put a whole different oh, spin God, on this the, movie. Yeah, the sound of music. No, Julie Adams. <laughs> oh, my God. Can you imagine Julie Andrews doing that? That would be incredible, yes. too. Yes, I can imagine her doing this. Absolutely. A thousand percent. <laughs> she, she'd go up to the hills in the town and, like, sing out about how they're screaming, like, like that it's Satan and stuff. I think her character would have a turn or like a complete turn where she'd end up singing with the band at one point. <laughs> no, she would be like, she would turn out to be like an angelic influence that saves the kids by uh, oh, letting them. Okay. Like, like singing along kind of deal. <laughs> See, I thought they would have gotten her because she'd never tried singing in a minor scale before and it would have flipped her lid. 
Oh, dude, evil Julie Andrews <laughs> singing metal next to Damien. That's a movie I need to see. So at this uh, this uh, freaking town hall meeting where Julie Adams, wannabe Julie Andrews, is talking <laughs> shit about this band that hasn't even like set foot in the town yet, the mayor stands up and is totally defending rock and roll. Like he's getting super passionate and reminding all this stuck up townspeople about how scared they were of the Beatles and how this is the same thing. And then the, the fricking English teacher walks in and he's like, you know what I mean, Matt? The entire crowd turns their heads to look at Matt who just walked in the door. You could hear a pin drop as they wait for this motherfucker to weigh in on the rock and roll situation. I love how the actor <laughs> stands there Looking like a deer in headlights, like the way that he plays the palpable fear of the entire weight of what's about to happen in the town is on his shoulders at that moment. The actor kind of physically gulps and then kind of chuckles like a person would do where you're like, oh, shit. But he does it like a little more over the top and comedically. And it's such a wonderful touch because then he responds and he literally talks the town down from the madness that they're they're getting ready to indulge in thanks to julie adams slash andrews nice uh so we get to meet our two our two teens our my primary teens here uh we're talking to john we're talking about johnny who is our typical metalhead who seriously this kid's fine um he, you know he and his dad have like a a cold kind of a relationship but this kid is in no real danger of actually becoming a ne'er-do-well. If you just let him explore his passions, then he'd be fine. He's the actual typical metalhead kid where yeah. the he music... Wants to rebel for yeah. over anything. Well, and it's it, it's not so much a rebellion with him. He just sees hypocrisy all around him. Uh, yeah. And he, like it, that whole Walt Whitman discussion that we went over, we were, like we just kind of passed over, like he has this whole diatribe of how he talks about how the town is so full of shit. And I believe it's his passionate diatribe that sends the teacher to that town hall meeting. Nice. That's that's my what I kind of infer from that anyway, or my interpretation of it. And the thing that he has to say is something that I believe every kid who's ever just wanted to listen to fucking merciful fate and be left alone and not have his parents burn his goddamn records every time they fucking find him. That's exactly what they want to say to their parents, but aren't able to because right. they're too busy trying to fish out that super rare vinyl that is now on fire. God damn it, mom. What's wrong with you? <laughs> My mom waited until like 1992 to look at my heavy metal. I've been listening to it since I was 11. So she waited until I was like almost 16 to go, well, give me that tape you're listening to. Give me that. Let me read these lyrics. And then she got all shocked and was like, this is talking about blood. This is talking about death. Do you like this? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. bro. Where have you been for the last four years of my life? <laughs> and so she just threw the tape. This is uh, Dead Horse. Uh, peaceful death and pretty flowers. She threw the tape at me. I was like, whatever. Parenting done for that half decade, mom. Like, awesome. <laughs> well, I actually had <sighs> records or CDs or tapes or whatever confiscated and destroyed or confiscated and wow. thrown out. Wow. No, I got off lucky, man. I had my parents were completely indifferent. Well, we were talking about Motley Crue, but this is this is a kind of an interesting story that talks about parents and, and music issues, right? We'll, we'll kind of get back to the movie review after this, but it's still Whatever. pertinent to everything that's happening. Do uh, it. Okay. I am playing a Motley Crue Greatest Hits CD at the age of like 11 or 12, and I play their cover of Anarchy in the UK on my stereo at home. Oh, no. My fucking dad comes in, takes the CD out of the CD player grabs the case off of the Motley Crue thing and says specifically what wants to know specifically what song it is and he says don't you ever play that version of the or don't you ever play this song from this CD again in this house <laughs> oh no and he confiscates the CD now he's a Motley Crue fan i just want to point that out he just wanted my greatest hits CD <laughs> that son of a gun that's, <laughs> that's how amazing. i look at it but like and he's super pissed about it right so it's Motley Crue once again fast forward like a couple months later, and I grab the Sex Pistols tape that I've had, and I play it that a friend of mine gave me or whatever, because I'm always tape trading. Everybody recorded everybody's records or CDs or whatever and passed cassettes back and forth. And that song comes on. 
And my dad's like ready to fucking flip out and like get super pissed at me. And I said, you said, don't play that song on that CD. <laughs> you smart ass. <laughs> You yeah, son I, of a bitch. <laughs> I paid for that dearly. But uh so I like the, did. Yeah, the Sex Pistols got super super banned in my house because of that. But everything else Motley Crue sang about was okay, like getting blowjobs and, you know, oh, Christ. the same old situation, <laughs> having to have your heart kick started from overdosing on heroin. That stuff is all cool because it's about pussy drugs and like, you know, awesomeness. But for fuck's sakes, don't you dare rhyme anarchist and antichrist. That is an abomination. How dare you? <laughs> That's one of the things. And I've uh, my morbid angel CDs. Um, Blessed are the sick, which was like super rare at the time that I had it in like the early 90s. I had a like a beautiful, pristine CD of that. Gone. <laughs> oh. <laughs> See, that's not fair. Yeah. They, th those guys were kidding. <laughs> right it's not like i was like i i believed it at the time but i know he was just a businessman but it was not like i it was like a deicide cd those i hid you know like those were I, really satanic yeah i could totally see someone <laughs> wanting to destroy once upon the cross you know like that makes sense why that would piss off a christian right so i mean that's the kind of thing that we're dealing with here is that kind of panic and because the album covers look crazy or it talks about sex we have to put in a sticker on there that says parental advisory when if you just look at the album cover and it's got a super long tongue and it says poison i'm pretty sure a parent should know their kids listening to that this is a quick story i got grounded once and my mom took away all my music all of my music for 30 days and because i got caught skipping school which i did like a whole three times in my whole life She's like, all right, I'm taking your music and you have to clean your room. I said, okay. So I cleaned my room and what do I discover, Court? Hidden Missing behind, music? <laughs> hidden, be hidden behind my cabinet was Guar, Scum Dogs of the Universe, on cassette. <laughs> Guess what I listened to for a month? <laughs> yeah, and that's a, a great month. fucking album to listen to for a month. Exactly. I have that album memorized dude yeah. it's ridiculous <laughs> gore is a great thing to discuss because it's a combination of actual music and a band that's performing and then this kind of cornball theatrics and yes. monsters and mayhem and really what this band is in black roses is a prototype for guar before we got guar like yeah, like major totally. guar and the beginning of it that's what sells us all on it if you are a fan of guar or to some extent, even Lordy, I believe, like if you never went with Guar and you just happen to be exposed to the monsters of rock and roll kind of deal from from Lordy. If you are a fan of that, where it's like people in monster makeup playing fucking rock or metal and you see the intro of this film, those monsters are going to have you sold. You're going to be totally. on board for anything else. Exactly. Like I'm saying, that's the hook because the movie fools you. So they agree to have the concert. But all the parents and the teachers groups, everyone's going to go to the concert to make sure everything's kosher with this band. Including Julie it's... Adams slash Andrews. Exactly. She's sick. <laughs> Doe, a deer, a female deer. I painted Ray, myself a into a corner with this joke. So <laughs> Ray, a drop of golden sun. Pentagram, get... a thing I carve into <laughs> myself. I carve into my chest. <laughs> so the so the freaking band starts playing at this this uh, chaperoned concert, and it is Whiplash. It is not not a band called Whiplash or or the the song was that a Metallica song that was Whiplash? Yes, I believe so. Thank unless you. they covered it and pretended like it was theirs, like they did. For oh, a few it was. Songs. Yeah, it was on Garage Days, probably. Yeah. So <laughs> th so they freaking so they freaking start playing, and it is. Not what I expected. They open with their kind of like, uh, oh, what's that word? Ballad. It's a power yeah, ballad. It's, their, it's the power ballad about like coming from a small town and being like a hometown boy kind of thing. And immediately the parents are like, oh, this is cool. Can we please go? Well, and, and the main guy is coming out in like this very 80s, very like Phil Collins style suit. Yes. Where... Oh, my God. It's so funny. that So you could even think that this the band at the beginning wasn't this band at all. Like you were totally it's meant to fool everyone. I like and... this little ruse that the band does because it really fits in with who they're trying to set up, what Damien could possibly be. This right. sort of trickster deceiver thing that they set up here i think works really well in the context of the overall tone of the story that we've already discussed that it's 
really kind of this after school special feel the way that they do this where Damien really truly is the deceiver and the name gives away who we think he actually is. Mm -hmm. They do it so well and they set it up so well with this that when the parents that fall for it and the elders of the town that fall for it and Julie Andrews sings herself out talking about going to carve a pentagram into her chest uh, (laughs) and everybody just kind of vacates like at that point you as the viewer know oh you guys done fucked up. (laughs) Which is really, it's this, it's this really great inversion where they are deceiving them in such an obvious way that they are automatically demanding your participation in this film as a, as a film viewer. And then as also, if you're watching it like us as rock and heavy metal fanatic kids, you see it and you're like, oh no, th- this is bad. This is, this is where they go from being, you know, Phil Collins and, and. <laughs> And Genesis, yeah, and they're, they're about to turn turns, into a, a Motley Crue, right? Well, it immediately turns into Headbangers Ball. It, it goes from <laughs> freaking, it goes from VH1 to fucking Headbangers Ball, dude. It's so funny. If people I are mean, barely even out the door. I love the sequence where the poetry teacher or the the English lit teacher is in the doorway, and he's looking at Damien, and yes. Damien's looking at him, and they like supernaturally somehow lock eyes. And it's it's, it's so like they're good. they're communicating between the two, and Damien's just like, just leave. You better leave. You have to go. I need to win these kids over. And that that sequence back and forth where they're like looking at each other, and it's all about those T zones and the power of those T zones, dude. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so so the concert goes down, and it doesn't. It looks pretty normal. You know, we don't we don't get any of the the weird shit that happens later. Uh, but immediately the next day, all the kids have grown huge freaking chips on their shoulders they're like at first you think they're just tired from the concert but oh no no no. these motherfuckers are now possessed by damien like from the first concert well what's basically happened what's basically happened is they heard the very first clash song of their life and they realized (laughs) how fucked up the world actually is and they thought it was fucked up that they weren't allowed to watch this band black roses but, you know, the song Remote Control just came on the radio and it just ruined their lives. <laughs> it's like so many other teenagers after them and before them. <laughs> right. But in the way that you just kind of wake up and be like, holy shit, Joe Strummer saw this all coming ages ago. So suddenly the kids are like, you know what? I hate Walt Whitman. Get this bullshit out of my face. Don't give a shit about Walt, Ralph Emerson, Waldo, whatever his name is. <laughs> they're all fucking tired they're all like strung oh, out God. like they did some kind of weird drug the night before they're just and slowly turning into monsters i didn't need the drugs i didn't do the drugs i was like coming down off of whitman <laughs> seriously th- there's not much i would never read again you know like i would never ever sit down and reread like the canterbury tales again like no I would never read Walt Whitman on purpose again. Like, blame it on my teachers. I didn't have cool teacher. I had Mrs. Anderson. No, I learned nothing from her. I was stealing the books from her cabinet. I was reading Brave New World on my own because I was in advanced English, not AP English. And what we were studying in advanced English sucked. What the AP kids reading was cool, but I was lazy and didn't do the work so instead of doing my homework i would steal books from her and get caught and i would read brave new world in class even though we were supposed to be reading the canterbury tales (laughs) what's awesome about that i told this story on i've told that this story about an english literature teacher that i had that also gave zero fucks because i think tenure um yes she was those Very old, like very close to retirement. And I think she was just trying to bump up her pay just a little bit more before she finally quit. (laughs) Or maybe she just, I don't know. There was part of her that must have loved teaching and why it kept her doing it. I'm not sure. But she gave so little fucks that when we were being taught literature from this teacher, when we were on Nathaniel Hawthorne, she showed us the House of Seven Gables. This is the episode I mentioned it on when we covered House of Seven Gables on Cinema PsyOps. When we covered that, she actually just played the the movie <laughs> with Vincent Price the House of Seven Gables that had the different stories and I love she it. she played that she played it in segments cuz our class block wasn't long enough to play an entire movie so we watched it for the amount of time that that moment that portion of literature was and the way that she justified it is she had us write 
sort of like a synopsis of the film, but then would also try and discuss the themes and everything like that. And then she would have an open discussion about what the story was about. It was her way of saying, I know you don't want to read this. I don't want to make you read this. But here is a way that I'm going to sideload the Cliff's notes into your brain so that <laughs> you at least understand how this stuff works. She gave enough of a fuck to hack it into my brain. And also, I found a bunch of great classic movies that I would have never watched otherwise. See? Like See? The Scarlet Letter. We never read The Scarlet Letter, but we watched the fucking movie and not the Demi Moore version one. And she would tell oh us what God. was wrong and what was different about the story. Last of the Mohicans, that was a long series to be taught because that took a lot of class time. But that's how she taught us, and she found a way around it. Now, I'm justifying it now because I've actually realized that I did learn something, but I don't think it was because of her. I think it was in spite of her. <laughs> <laughs> and so these kids talking back in this movie to this teacher who actually is engaged, is, in, is involved with them, treats them like adults, recognizes that they have agency over their own minds, and really just wants them to contemplate the thoughts of what is best for them in their life, like what... What choices will make them happy? Which is really what he seems to want to do. When the kids turn on him, that's when you know things are going sour, right? right? Exactly. <laughs> so he, and he senses it and he's like, holy shit, I got to go talk to this freaking dude, uh, Damien, because something's gone horribly wrong. Yeah. And one so night, then, one concert turns one them concert. into people that have listened to the entire back catalog of The Clash and been educated. <laughs> He freaking goes to see Damien. It's the most confusing scene ever because Damien has not, he doesn't have the wig on, doesn't have any, any of his heavy metal accoutrements. Uh, both Lietta, who was watching this with me, and I thought, this is their manager, right? He's talking to their manager. That's how much of a like costume change, like a totally subverts your expectations. And also, he and Teach, they're sipping on some glasses of milk. Okay, I just want to state this right now, Duder. That guy without the 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 big old wig on the that plays Damien, you know, and yeah. and the whole heavy metal outfit. I have seen this film four times. Every fucking time, I forget <laughs> that that's him, and I think the same thing. This movie the only has reason, the some only reason of, I know is because he says our music. Right, that's the only clue. Right, that's when everybody gets it. This is this is the thing. This movie has the capability of somehow wiping your brain from realizing that Big Pussy Bump and Sarah shows up in it and dies in it. <laughs> that Julie Adams becomes Julie Andrews because I stumble over something that I'm saying in this film and becomes this Jesus freak like Dana Carvey's church lady. I forget nice. those three things. And I always forget that he's just wearing a wig as a rocker and they're they're doing this another level of deception that Damien is doing. Where he's pretending just to be a businessman. He knows this is a business. This is what the kids mm -hmm, like. Mm -hmm. And that's why he wears a wig. And But he normally dresses like this 80s style Miami Vice detective. Like, that's the outfit that he's wearing. And I think the movie intentionally just cuts to him. He doesn't identify himself as Damien. So that nope. you don't realize it till he says our music. And then he says goodbye to him and he says him by name, right? Yeah. And the guy's like, yeah, well, actually, it's this name. You know, this is who actually right. who I am. Like, it's like my Damien's my stage name or whatever. And then when the teacher exits, he's been completely reassured. This evil fucking deity thing that is Damien foresaw what was going to happen with the teacher and knew he was going to be a problem from him sticking around just a little longer last night and set this all up because he went and talked to the mayor. <laughs> Like, he got the confidence of the mayor. This is like so Loki good. in the Norse legends, god of mischief, mischief, levels of deception that this Damien guy is capable of. Like, he's so multiple steps ahead, like an ancient pagan god. This is really well put together in my mind. Like, I go. like that. I really fucking dig it. And uh, this is why I wanted to do it on this show, because I could geek out and really talk about how much I enjoy this silly little movie that I totally appreciate is completely silly to the rest of the world and what they were trying to do, or at least what I see them trying to do. And and I am happy to enable you to do yes, these things. Please I do. Feed it. I feed it. Uh, this, this is Damien. He's played by Sal Viviano. Um, he worked with uh, the director again on a movie that looks amazing. Uh, called the jitters yeah yeah i want to see that an action we... comedy horror movie that looks awesome well i mean if it's anything like this film we gotta see it right it's gotta be right. fucking good 
his his profile picture is a screenshot of the movie of the black roses freaking uh uh poster they're putting up all over town which is a headshot of damien which says damien live I believe that he was that's the poster actually the Black Roses Damien Live that's the poster it's they put so, up everywhere all over the it's town. It's so good. It's so yeah. confusing. <laughs> it really is. The actor himself I believe was like um a musical stage actor and yes. o- only did a few things on screen with this particular director though the two movies that you already mentioned. But seeing how he performs and how he holds himself and conducts himself in the rock god style whenever he's actually trying to do the performance to look like the actual rocker part of it, not the monster rocker, because there's different aspirations. He is totally channeling David Lee Roth in the way that he moves and he stands. Oh, and nice. Without doing the crazy backflips and everything, but like that, yeah. that like Adonis pose that Roth always did where he'd hold the microphone while, while Eddie's doing his solo. And like, he's how I record the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Like that 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 rocker pose that he would strike to try and draw attention away to like look as sexy as possible that, that yep. David Lee always did. Fucking Damien does that like three or four times. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great. Like he nails it. But then when he goes into the transition where he's becoming like the more evil rocker, then you know the, the devil horns come out and it's total Dio with a little touch of King Diamond in the Merciful Fate days for me. Is, is how he holds himself and like how he holds the microphone, especially doing the microphone devil horns thing a couple times. <laughs> nice. Uh, so we get the scene with our, with our buddy from uh fricking, uh, I keep wanting to say good fellas. And then the guy from uh, Sopranos. Yeah, that too. We go to him and he's, he's encouraging his son to turn off his heavy metal rock and music. And he, he kicks his son out of the room and he's sitting there listening to nothing. He's just, you know, like reading the paper and all of a sudden the stereo comes back on. Oh, the we record should record starts playing. What's that? We we should probably discuss the very homophobic thing he says about his son having an earring, which was very prevalent. Oh in the my 80s. God! Thank you. Yes, that's also in the uh, the um the what do you call it um the keywords this movie. The keyword is homophobic slur. And, this uh, is the only one really in the film because yes, it doesn't seem God. like any it's of the kids doozy. really seem to care about that. Yeah. So he notices his son has an earring, and he's, and he's like, "What's his earring? You know, son." Uh, Freaking! Uh, the only people who have earrings are pirates and f words. And you're like, oh, the '80s were wonderful. Like, <laughs> I know that they're portraying this character as a as a boorish jackass, but you're still like, they were playing that line for laughs. I think. <laughs> I think putting it in the mouth of a man who is very clearly ignorant and about to die a horrible death by some of the most interesting um, practical effects I've ever seen come out of a speaker in my life. Um, True. By doing that, it does diffuse it because it does say, yeah, this guy's a fucking homophobe, which even in the 80s was super acceptable still to most people. But in the way that it's doing it, I think it's trying to set it up like, hey, you fill yourself with hate. You're going to get eaten by black roses via a speaker. Which should still be happening to homophobes today. Well, at an exponential rate. I think like the more that society realizes that homophobia is the wrong side of history the more people should be eaten via speaker and Black Rose's music for being homophobes. <laughs> By puppets. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> so uh, this this is the one thing I didn't like about this movie was, uh, so so the, this whole sequence is great, don't get me wrong. Uh, sound design got a little on my nerves here. So the record comes back on by itself, starts molting, molting? starts melting and like freaking like pulsing and he has to touch it. Looks it looks like it has cancerous tumors growing off of it which makes you want to touch it right he's like oh i'm gonna touch this freaking thing and he touches it i'm just doing an impersonation of that guy you know just let let me let me have it people and all of a sudden a little puppet monster comes out of the speaker and starts attacking him and what drove me bananas during this sequence is the little monster sound effects like wicka, 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 wicka. it is so loud and it goes sounded on. like pac-man didn't it it yes. sounded like pac-man like through a distortion pedal they ran pac-man so through the irritating. rat the rat distortion pedal they just ran pac-man through it and that's that's what happened out of this whole movie other than a one other little thing which i'll talk about at the very end one tiny tiny thing that's i liette and i both found very funny um this is the only thing that just drove me nuts i was like please god let this scene end i can't listen to this sound anymore and i not only do i have a sickening disgusting voice 
I also make horrible sounds with all my guitar pedals, so I don't know what's wrong with me. You'd think that'd be like my favorite part of the movie. That no, it undercuts the effect. It, you should the next time you watch it, just mute that part whenever the attack happens. Fuck that! I'm gonna turn it up louder. <laughs> <laughs> but like, what I'm getting at is the practical effects for this are super oh, cool, and it, you're so right. It awesome. totally it totally undercuts it to have that sound effect, and it totally does not yes. work. They should have just had the sound of the music get kind of crazy or even better, do some backmasking a la trick or treat yep. <laughs> that we will cover oh, someday. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Folks, stay tuned for our Halloween episode on frickin' uh, trick or treat. Oh, yeah, that's perfect, actually. Perfect. The, uh, there's a literal what the fuck where uh, he goes, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, but the audience is thinking that at the same time. Exactly. So it actually works. <laughs> He's the man of the so, people for that moment. He gets eaten. And then the freaking monster burps, which I love. That was great. Yeah. Gotta once have again, a belch that, on, this, on the sound. Once again, that after school special tongue in cheek thing. Yes, exactly. Uh, we get another concert where um, they're, they're playing uh, freaking uh, Black Roses. The Black Roses song Soldiers of the Night is playing. And I think that's my favorite of the songs from the ba- that band in the movie, which I don't think we talked about the soundtrack at all on metal blade records or at least it was that is incredible and it's got some metal blade artists we got bang tango uh we've got freaking uh hallows eve which i was listening to today which are amazing uh it's got tempest and of course freaking king cobra which weirdly enough um i had a king Cro king cobra promotional still that I scored from my library. We were throwing out a bunch of old stuff, like a bunch of old promo shit from the school newspaper <laughs> because they were like, here, archive these for us. And we were like, yeah, these aren't worth anything. These are just like banned promo. Like we could sell these on eBay. And they're like, no, please throw them away. So of course I stole some. <laughs> um, I took a one, the one from King Cobra was awesome. It was so cool. I don't know where the hell, that's probably hidden somewhere in my music room. But no, I really like the songs, uh, the actual like, um, yeah, we should the, actually the black roses songs. We should really talk about that. I was kind of being facetious about it where there, you know, like I, I make mention of like cock rock stuff and everything and how it feels like Motley Crue. But what they did with this music is emulate very perfectly the exact style of more popular hard rock slash metal of that era. Yeah. Like, some of the songs that are more intense and feel more like the demonic side of things, like when they start talking about the the soldiers song that you were talking about that you really, really liked. And some of the other songs when they're really like bringing the kids to the evil side, that goes to the straight heavy metal your mother warned you about from the era. And like yes. the, the bands that you're naming very much are in that, that vein of like that, uh, that range from like iron maiden to Judas priest of like heavy metal slash hard rock acts at the time that are all just rocking it out and like filling stadiums. And this is another sort of that kind of band that you would see either on one of their undercards or coming up and competing with them. Like it sounds well, exactly like that era, like perfectly. Well, the freaking drummer is uh, a dude named Carmine Apiche. I believe that's how you pronounce it. He was in freaking vanilla fudge. He yeah, was the, he was the drummer from freaking Vanilla Fudge. So, you know, he knows rock. I, I think, <laughs> you know, I, there's a lot of the songs. If you look at the end credits, there's a lot of the songs where they put together an actual heavy metal band. Exactly. Where I, think they, I think they just grabbed various artists from various bands and they said, hey, you want to do a project for a movie? You're, you're going to be this band. And they taught the band everything. And then they hired this, uh, the, the main actor who plays Damien, who is known for being a musical performer on stage, which is quite genius to put him in the role that they did. For that, they just needed to pull him back a little bit for when he's you know, not performing and, and have him just act like he would in the camera. And I think he does an excellent job there. He's at the same level of the right amount of drama with everybody else. He's matching yeah. everyone that's around him. So he's clearly going along with what the director's saying. But nice. they put together this band like they're the monkeys in that the producers needed them to fill this role okay. for this particular film. Chuck Wright, the freaking uh, bass player from uh, Quiet Riots in the band. And I would actually submit to you that they handpicked the people that they needed 
for those yeah. specific roles because of the sound that they wanted. I think someone sound designed this band to be exactly what they wanted like this in the film. Somebody oh. had to put this together. And I I don't know who was the main person that did that. I mean, was it the same person who did, did the score? Did they help? Right become like the the malcolm mclaren of this band but like in a good <laughs> <Exactly>. way <laughs> and and one of the dudes from king crowbra too look at that yeah see when nice. it comes to when it comes to this era of hard rock and metal there is pedigree they put into this band this isn't just like have somebody write a bunch of songs and pay no real respect to the actual era of the type of music that we're yeah. hinting at here like somebody put love into this film and that's obvious yeah. Yeah, the uh, the people who wanted to warn us about the evils of metal, bro. But like in the kind of way that the, in the kind of way that like metal always warns you about the evils of metal, because like they always talk about how they're going to damn your soul in like every fucking song anyway. So like it, oh. it, that's where I'm back to this. It's subverting the satanic panic Christian propaganda films of the time that did exist that I did watch yes. <laughs> forcibly. And now you watch them for fun. Yeah, because I laugh at them. The uh, so at this concert they start turning some of the fans into skeletons because it so it looks like they're they're feeding off of the people by sucking their souls out and the people turn into like the uh, the shrunken head guy from uh, Beetlejuice. Yeah, they look like that, oh or they God. look like um, the zombie that gets uh, cut in half in re- the original Return of the Living yes. Dead. Ooh, ooh, or freaking uh, um. What's that Toby Hooper movie? What's that Tuber movie? Life Force. Whenever Life they Force. drain them all out, yes. That's right. I call him Tuber. That's a known. <laughs> that's a known thing. Yeah, like Lambava, because the more Lambava, Thanks. the more better. The more Lambava, more better. You are here for a reason, and it's because you are amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> that means a lot. We get. We get. Um. So that night, uh, for the second concert. Or the third concert, I'm losing track of how many fucking concerts this band on the flyer. It says they're going to play for four nights in April, which we are recording this about. <laughs> hey, Perfect. We, this is an Easter movie, dude. <laughs> we're recovering from the four concerts, brother. <laughs> yeah, it's like the fourth through the seventh, or they're doing like five nights in a row to try and work out the kinks. They talk about yes. that. That's what they're trying to do. But I guess the spell working that they're doing to take mm-hmm. over these kids' minds. It must be like a multiple part over the course of days kind of ritual that they have to yeah. do. That's yeah. the only thing I can think as to why it would have to be five nights other than just an excuse for this pan to be in town for a week. The only thing more insidious that took four days was me losing my virginity. I don't I didn't have a joke when I started that sentence. I'm not Sorry. sure we have one now that you finished it. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. So while he's out driving around the town... We find out that the the idyllic town of Mill Basin is now as bad as Tampa, Florida on any other night. Well, that is pretty much where death metal came from, so it totally makes <laughs> sense. Dude, Morris Sound Studios, I used to live near it, and I used to drive by Morris Sound Studios, and I'm thinking of all the Swedish bands that flew to Florida to fucking record there. <laughs> so insane (sighs) now it's still there but they took all the signs down so now it's like a private recording studio that only only no one uses i'm not sure (laughs) that's kind of funny because the same thing happened here thanks to bright eyes and then everybody was like you know omaha saddle creek and they were talking about it people would come to record at saddle creek studios and it became this big big fucking thing for like a hot minute and now you can't even like there's no recognition at all like omaha had its one moment omaha's coming back bro <laughs> it's all me man it's court science i'm bringing it back for the people say, you will be involved <laughs> you will say when it ends and you will say when it begins <laughs> in that in that order <laughs> but yeah what you're what you're describing or the the way that the town falls apart here and when you say everyone like it turns into downtown tampa what he means is rampant violence drugs <laughs> yes. rape uh muggings oh um kids prowling the streets like it looks like the kind of post-apocalyptic town you're about to see fucking robocop shoot oh. some dude in a in the dick while walking S- simon gonna... wright our, our our pal the co-host simon would love this part so one kid freaking runs over his mother his it's mom the is the tony young. kid who was yeah, pussy yeah, yeah. bumping sarah's the- son yeah Yes, he his he backs over his mom in the driveway on purpose, 
And when she hits the ground, the music cue is so Twin Peaks. Like that moment is like Lynchian. It's so freaking perfect. Like it's like a total, oh my God, like Laura would get out of the car and be like, oh shit. <laughs> like it's so good. Oh my God, dude, this town is very much like Twin Peaks. That's yes. the tone that we couldn't figure out. It's that same <laughs> melodrama tone. Good oh Lord, God. that is there this whole entire time. I've never <laughs> realized it. Because I always thought it was going against the Christian Scare films that would have that kind of tone. But no, it's Lynchian too, which oh makes boy. it even more of a nightmare. <laughs> One of the things we learned during all this this insanity is when uh, Mr. Uh, Morehouse, or Teach, he goes to the mayor's house to frickin' uh, tell the mayor all the shit that's going down. He runs into his on-and-off girlfriend, Priscilla. The mayor's daughter. The mayor's daughter, who's played by Carla Ferrigno, Lou Ferrigno's, fr- you know, the Incredible Hulk's frickin' sister. Oh, my God. Oh, wait, is it his sister? Let's, let me make sure it's not his wife. Hopefully it's not his sister and his wife. Well, yeah, you would hope that wouldn't happen. No, she is not the sister of Ferrigno. She married Lou Ferrigno. Ah. And they're still married. And they have three children together. She is, like, not helping at all. She pretends her dad isn't there, which is very strange. And they have this big blowout, and he tells her off. uh, She resents him spending so much time with her father and his students. So she just completely accosts him and does everything she can to undermine the big concern and fear that he has at this moment. It's insane. Like, it makes no sense and is the least adult thing any human being could possibly do in this situation. There's clearly something wrong with this man, and she just (laughs) picks a fight as an excuse to break up with him because she probably wants to go sleep with Damien. Oh, my God. Uh, we get a uh, we get a great scene of a kid being uh, sat on. It's called babysitting, <laughs> where this kid's being looked after, and because there's some uh, freaking Black Roses, aka Damien. I wish the name of the band had been Damien and the Black Roses. It'd be so much less confusing. <laughs> he's yeah, I... listening to this metal, and he's throwing his freaking toys into the fire, which is really really bizarre because he's crossing uh, universes. He has a Marvel villain. Yeah. <laughs> In Mysterio fighting Batman and with Superman there. And then Batman and Superman are both burned alive in his fire uh, by Mysterio, which is extremely bizarre because those figures would be worth a shitload of money yes, now. If only this kid knew about eBay. But <laughs> yeah, what those I Super Friends really... figures would have been worth a lot. <laughs> exactly. A girl we haven't talked about because she's sort of not uh, memorable. Vicky. And her pal, another teenage girl, all done up in their heavy metal, were going out for the night gear. They come back from the concert, and they put the kid to bed. And then the one girl's like, oh, I can't go home because my parents are out of town. And you know where this is going. Because all of a sudden, the daughter is like, oh, man, I'm tired. Good night. And he's like, please don't leave me alone with your sexy teenage friend. The way they set it up, too. When the two girls walk in and are talking about the show that they just had and like, you know, she needs to stay and will you stay up with us or whatever? And he's like, no, it's a school night. You can't, you know, whatever. You yeah. you, you can't stay here until your parents are coming in or coming home. So they know the mother's gone. The kid just went to bed. He talks about how the mother's playing gin. So she'll be gone till almost two in the morning, you know, maybe later. Mm-hmm. So they're they're setting this up specifically to entrap him and ensnare him. And we're seeing this whole temptation thing, which is, again, leading him into damnation. Yes. It it brings in that whole, like, the path of damnation is heavy metal. It's Satan. And it's all about the temptation. It's all about the carnal desires, all the things that you're supposed to be denying yourself to make it into the kingdom of heaven. And they're just using that as a weapon. And it's a perfect subversion of those kind of scare tactics where you get led astray to commit what this guy's about to commit. Now, having said that, this is an underage girl. This is a grown-ass adult man. This is fucking illegal and disgusting. <laughs> he should have made that girl wait in his daughter's room yes. with his daughter and be as far away from him as possible. But otherwise, this whole like masturbation porno fantasy thing they're about to throw out at us wouldn't have happened. But instead, they play strip gin, which I have never heard of in my life. It's just and an of, excuse for her to get naked and seduce exactly. him. And of course, uh, she loses, um, but he wins because then uh, she jumps in his lap after stripping and he puts his arms around her and immediately dies of an orgasm heart attack. 
they knew like the one daughter obviously knew her father mm. had a serious heart condition so they seduce him they get him worked up and she gets him so turned on that he has a heart attack mm. because of all the blood rushed away from him down ah, to another but, area but i don't mean to quote scripture here luke 14 58 6 says if you don't put it in you ain't doing no sin since he died of a heart attack he goes to heaven boom uh that's uh, not how it works that's because in uh, well i'm not reading the bible <laughs> that's in the bible <laughs> <laughs> right. But in the actual biblical sense Unabridged uh, Bible. <laughs> in the actual Bible, there's a passage about how if a man lusts after a woman in his heart, he has already committed that sin. Jimmy which justifies Carter, no. Which which justifies him just going ahead and doing what he's about to do anyway, no. which is how this stuff is laid out. It's guilt and then feeling awful about the decisions you make that are supposed to be sins that are basic carnal desires. And then when you submit to them, you need to feel guilty. So therefore you have to go to church, you have to give them money and you have to pray. And then they will tell you everything is okay because you've done all of that. But then you go back to the cycle of being a human being, just indulging in your desires that are supposed to be sins and you're dragged right back again. That's, that's how this all works. But that's why Jimmy Carter is still alive because he lusted in his heart and he's scared of going to hell. (laughs) <laughs> peanut farmer sometimes i feel like this doomed show is actually a conspiracy theory waiting to happen <laughs> so uh johnny uh gets a special treat from a, a, a mysterious woman uh johnny's real horny and he's going to bed and all of a sudden a freaking naked lady shows up in his room and they do it i believe she... that was the bass player in the band right because there was a female oh, bass it's, player it's my favorite well-lit scene in the dark <laughs> where it's this beautifully shot scene and the only thing i couldn't get out of it was who the hell that lady was so yes thank you for noticing who that was but he has sex and then she disappears and he did the first thing i did after i lost my virginity i killed my father <laughs> oops i mean i didn't no jesus he... christ stop listening to so many deep cuts of the doors you'll be fine <laughs> oh jeez um that's from uh, i want to hold your hand by the doors So he blows his dad away, just shoots him in the head, which I think is unfair. I think his dad was genuinely concerned, like, Johnny, or whatever your name is, I don't remember you, you're my son, are you okay? And then he shoots him to death, and it's like, way to go, Johnny. Johnny's feeling great. He is feeling great, he just frickin' had sex with a woman who disappeared. And you not being able to tell who that was, I'm guessing... I, that's the, <laughs> the only thing that because I was like, I, I didn't see any other woman in the film that had dark hair like that. Any of the other girls. And it was definitely a dark haired woman. So that's why I'm guessing <laughs> that it was the bass player, because it's the only dark haired woman that was in the film. And it would make sense that, it, you know, a demon accolade of Damien would come to take it him was, over uh, and, and win him completely. It was Lou Ferrigno's stepsister. <laughs> Since, <laughs> since it wasn't his wife, it was his stepsister. That's so crazy so, that Lou Ferrigno's wife is in this film. This makes brilliant. me enjoy it even more. Like it's I, brilliant. I, it's awesome. The next day at school, uh, our our good old pal Janie or whoever, uh, she freaking uh, is is talking about her dead parent to the principal. Who I love the principal, but I like is he another freaking like uh, what do you call it a character actor? I don't know, but he strikes me as somebody. That's the thing. Everybody in this movie, we've said it before, and I'm telling you, everyone feels like something you've seen before. I never look them up because I don't want to find out that I'm wrong because yeah. this movie already is <laughs> deep in my brain and controlling me, and I don't like it. You are controlled. Um, <laughs> very much so. She says, I just want to scream out the window. He's like, that's a very, that's a very positive thing you want to do to deal with your grief let's open a window let's open this window behind me here opens up the window and instead of doing some primal scream therapy she pushes his ass out the window well she did say i i thought she always said like throw a scream out the window and she does she throws something screaming out the window and then and she goes (laughs) good scream (laughs) when the kids go like super bad you know and it's it's, it's, fun it's this total like cornball moment where it's like i may be bad but it feels so good like an army of darkness whenever Ash's girl turns over. That's like that kind of cornball where they all start murdering people, but it's comical and a little whimsical and fun and goes with that whole Twin Peaksy kind of tone yes. we were talking about. 
I'm Lita Ford, your host for the Headbangers Ball this week. We've got some videos coming up um, this hour. Cinderella, Shake Me, Dawkins' latest, and Ozzy Osbourne's Crazy Train, and a new one from Aerosmith called Angel. Right here, the latest from ACDC, Heat Seeker. We get uh, the teach doing the best shit ever. He does some frickin' research at the library. I love seeing him going through all of this stuff. It, and yes. it's something that uh, I know she listens to the show, so I'm going to give her a shout out. Jamie J. Salmon's out there, loves the microfiche scenes in libraries, and oh, I'm, I'm also a fan of it as well. He, him doing the research totally makes sense, and this sequence totally really fulfills that quite well. Oh, we didn't see any microfiche, but he's digging into the books no. and stuff. I wish we would have seen some, like, you know, old-fashioned devil, like, selling your soul woodcuts. Like the ones that yes. always end up on Morbid Angel albums, like where Dude. someone's kissing Satan's ass while you're stepping on a cross or something. Like, you need to have those in there to really push the everyone's losing their souls narrative forward and bringing in that it's an ancient evil. That that He missed mm -hmm. an opportunity to be looking at those by a microfiche. You could have just thrown up a ton of them. They could have added five minutes onto the movie of him going through microfiche to find out that Damien had done all these different forms. Like he was there during the 50s rock and roll scene. That could have been a whole sequence of him scrolling through <laughs> microfiche with him as like Damien and the Rockers from 1959 or some shit. That would have been great. They could have sent it all the way back to whenever that musical... Um formation of the devil's triad you know that that yes. riff that everyone's always like <laughs> like like living in to be metal whenever mm -hmm. that was found and created back in the days of like classical music whenever it was written they should have totally had him like see that it was the same guy and those are the actual <laughs> notes that do possess you that's why it's the devil's triad hey he could have been a freaking violin player and been paganini and shit <laughs> Oh my God, that would have been perfect. And then we could have brought in some uh, Paganini horror, my man. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. God, oh, that's so another good. one. We covered that on Cinema Psyops. That's another one that was a revelation yep. for the first oh, time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah we, did, we did that too. That was a Jeffrey pick through and through. What a great movie. Oh my oh, God. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, this movie is 84 minutes. I would, not, I would not add anything to it. It's perfect running time. Even though I just did add something to it. But just ignore that. Well, that five minutes of the research and everything, if this were a film going for a more serious, terrifying tone than what we've gotten with this like monsters and, you know, satanic panic invasion type film, if it were more of a serious tone and he was actually monster hunting and he was getting serious and he had to battle the devil doing this research, I mean, the next step for him is to get an old priest and a young priest, you know, beyond that to make it even <laughs> more serious. But like... They know that this is the kind of thing that you need in a horror film. So they put this in here. They show you the research. He, he's looking into this stuff and he finds out that bad stuff is on the horizon and it's not going to stop. And now he needs to do something about it. They cover that side of it. But then they just completely veer away from it with what we're about to discuss because it's going to shift the tone because it's getting too serious and we can't have this in this film. It has to be just a good time, man. That's right. Uh, we go to the Red concert. Where now, now frickin' uh, Black Roses is doing their thing, but everything's in red. They've given up the facade of being not the evil band completely. And the creepiest shit ever, I love, this actually freaked me out, was the audience is just hanging on his every word. And he's just talking to them with a creepy voice. And the whole audience is just chanting this weird spell at him. It's so good. This sequence really drives home the fear of what everyone who is into the whole satanic panic thing. Yeah. This really drives that point forward. This is what they're afraid of, that someone is going to control the minds of your children through heavy metal, rock and roll, whatever. Mm -hmm. This is what the whole sum of satanic panic is. And while people are definitely willing to do a whole hell of a lot to save the, you know, or do things for the rock and roll rock star, or they will do anything to go see them perform and everything. They're still an entertainer and they're not going to completely control someone's mind. Sure. There may be some weak minded folks out there that would be susceptible and maybe try to emulate the stars that they watch too much, but that is more on the fringe. You know, it's this, yeah. it's the same thing with the fear that they had of D and D and that amazing Tom Hanks film that they've 
<laughs> for oh, two stops yes. like that, which great I, movie mazes and wow. monsters right that's a perfect companion piece yep. to this i love that film by the way mazes and monsters if i ever meet tom hanks i'm gonna beg him to sign my dvd <laughs> <laughs> he'll be like that was unexpected <laughs> i would believe so yes but like it's it's the same thing where the the person's mind is being swayed away and you know it's destroying them but it's like this force that, but in his case it's mental illness but in this it's it's like the actual true pure evil it all comes back to that specific thing of the evil bringing people in and this moment where he's doing the chanting and everyone is gathered around him and it becomes where they're all doing the ritual this is the point of no return right this is where we get propelled in the final portion Mm -hmm. of the act but it also feels even more cult-like and terrifying because this is what everyone's afraid of their minds are going to be taken over and it's clearly happened this reminded me i don't know if you've read the book there's a book called uh the scream by a uh, John Skip and Craig Spector. It's a 80s horror novel where uh, this band called, I believe they're called The Scream, uh, go around and they are actually like trying to summon demons at their concerts and all hell breaks loose, literal and figurative hell breaks loose at their concerts. And this movie reminded me of that book. It's pretty great. I have not read that, but that definitely sounds familiar. It's like there's a there was like a movie I think they may have adapted from the book. Possibly. I mean it's 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 a very unique book in that it ties in real rock and roll stars. There's a whole sequence where they do a concert that is broadcast on MTV and it's like one of those uh band aid or live aid kinds of things. So like Madonna's there. And like U two's there, and then like all this hell breaks loose, and it's it's wild. It's a crazy book. This moment, because they do come back to this, where the and the more involved the kids get, the more they're already transformed, or the more they're painted up. But at this point, they're already gone, like full metal. The thing that your parents should be afraid of, like they're all all in black. They're all wearing black roses gear. They're all like, you know, the leather stud bracelets and like the safety pins through the cheeks and all the things that parents were terrified. These kids are all doing. It's there. There's there's one thing we didn't talk about. So uh, Johnny earlier in the movie is drawing the the frickin uh, the Black Roses Damien skull from their album cover on the back of his jacket. Is that and puff it's paint? Like this... Was he using the Pax puff paint stuff? <laughs> yes, he's using his uh, his frickin embossing. Speaking of embossing ventricular, ventricular, <laughs> Ventic- he's, uh, he's doing his, he's doing his jean jacket that way. And it's so funny because it's this like goofy skeleton, like kind of like <laughs> at the, at the, the viewer, you know, the, 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 uh, the viewer of the picture, I guess that's what you call him. Yeah. It looks and, like a skull that a psycho Billy band would, you know, put yes, a pompadour on and like, make it their logo. It's what like eighties skateboard companies thought was cool. Yeah, it looks like the Bones Brigade skeleton. Yeah, exactly. And then later they have a much cooler album cover. That's like uh, it almost looks like that that skull. That's the uh, the Death's Head moth kind of looking skull. I'm not sure. It switches up later. I'm not. I think they just had a uh, a maybe the design wasn't ready until the middle of production and they changed it. Or it could be possible that whoever was the production designer involved in printing up the cardstock to be the album covers wasn't communicating with the person who did the <laughs> costuming that made the yes. skulls for all the t-shirts. And that man grew up to be Mr. Kinko. <laughs> and is now super rich off of your copies. <laughs> Founder of the Kinko, man. We get a weird moment with Julie uh, where she's apparently her stepdad's creepy and oh yes he's creepy but before she goes to see him she pulls down her top and plays with her breasts and it's totally a body double because they never show her from the the neck up and then she fixes her little uh outfit then she goes to what we think is to seduce her stepdad but then she just beats him to death i think that breast fondling scene was forced to be put in there by the producers so they had something to help sell the film because, because we know naked boobs always sell movies. Well, what's even funnier is that later she gets naked, but it's not her that's in this scene. Yeah, I think they they just needed to amp up the amount of breasts that were in the film. So they used a shot of her getting ready, then inserted a shot at the same mirror of a different woman wearing the exact same outfit. <laughs> and the important part is, is they were like, can you come back and do this scene? And she said, oh, no, thank you. 
Uh, either that or they just hired somebody else real quick just to be able to throw some more boobs in to give it yes. that much more nudity to be able to sell it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Which, given that one of the producers was James Glickenhaus, I'm not surprised. <laughs> oh, God, we can talk all about that guy. So <laughs> she, she, you think that she is like going to go for uh, for Damien, but oh, no, no, no. This whole thing is to get to teach. So she slashes freaking Priscilla's throat. She waits for Priscilla in her car and then slashes her throat. Then she goes to seduce Teach and she does a fairly good job. She gets pretty close to seducing him, but then she mons she demons out on him. <laughs> well, he and, he basically oh goes God. full on abuser and like slaps her across the face yes. because she's about to go down on him and he does that screaming no when he could have just pushed her back and stepped back himself. Yeah. As a way to like I don't know, like the, the, the physical striking of that just seems so unnecessary and out of character for him. But then the actor plays it like he's terrified right afterwards. So I, <laughs> I think that works, right? Like he's horrified yeah. at the thing that he was driven to do. But then they go into this whole thing where she transforms and that's amazing. Let's yes. <laughs> I'm gonna let you take that over. You go you go ahead well, first. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I slap people every day. <laughs> Because I am so tired of them trying to make mouth love to me, and I've got work to do, so I'm slapping. Okay. 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 To have that be a major problem in my life, to where I literally have to beat people away from performing oral sex on me, is not something that I ever thought that I would want to admit on a podcast, but I want that. That's the life that I would like to have. Read my new book, To Have and to Blow. <laughs> uh, no Mouth Hugs Are Free by <laughs> Richard Glenn Schmidt. That's my novel. <laughs> An autobiographical novel. Yes. It's semi-autobiographical. So she turns into a demon in a spectacular sequence. They do the crazy monster effects, but they also do the awesome freaking light, like the crazy... Um, hand painted freaking like wacky purple and blue lights shooting around all over her body thing as she stretches into this fucking redonkulous monster <laughs> i guess they were going to do like a rod puppet transformation for her arm and her hand that didn't quite work right yep. because the animation covers the fact that she's just looking at her hand and moving it and nothing's happening so i, I think maybe <laughs> something happened there that they did that but also whenever they use it in other parts, it's when they are actually doing some stretching or, you know, various things are happening to transform her, like the neck and things like that. Mm. So they're, I think they're doing cross dissolves and then they covered it with the rotoscoping. But the end result is absolutely 100% very effective and cool. And yep. it, it just like uses to the best of its ability oh, yeah. what is currently available. And on the DVD, it looked incredible. I'd love mm -hmm. to see uh, HD transfer of this if it was shot on film. You know, to, to really kind of compare those elements, that would be amazing. Like if a Vinegar Syndrome you know, or Severin Synapse would get a hold of this, or Synapse, yeah, Synapse DVD, yeah. maybe they can do a Blu-ray in the they future. Should. Well, I they know they should. They said they couldn't do one of the Deadly Spawn because the elements weren't available. But I don't know about this film. <laughs> yeah, who but, knows? But it would be glorious if they could do it. But they've got Italian properties to put on 4K discs first. <laughs> so, so I think he kills her. Does he stab her with something? Or does he just get away from her? No, but does he knock her unconscious? What happens? I cannot why, why really, can't for the remember? life of me, remember how he gets away from her. I don't the think the monster he is so crazy that I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, like it transforms and then it turns into like all these various like puppets with cross dissolves. And then the final <laughs> puppet form is like, it looks like a mold of her body, but then it's like the neck and. The face of this puppet that's coming at him looks exactly like the puppet that Tommy Doyle in Friday the 13th 4 had that Tom Savini yeah. made. I mean, it's the exact same facial structure. And knowing that we've had some people that maybe work with Savini in the past, hey. per perhaps that puppet got repurposed from his shop. Maybe it was given to them to be able do to you... do that for this film because it looks a lot like it just repainted. Do you remember Luke Miranda's drop kick from uh, from Torso when when he runs and drop kicks the killer in the chest? How could you forget? That's what happened. Teach ran 
and drop kick the monster and then that the scene just cuts hard away from that how did we forget that because the monster is so insane and that's all no, you can remember he, he, he didn't really do that <laughs> i was just trying to think of something <laughs> to See, that, explain what you, happened you just found a way to improve that okay i i totally believe that he drop kicked <laughs> the monster i totally did no, yeah. I think I think it transforms, but it doesn't come after him, and I think he just runs away like the hero he is. Yeah, yeah. My my favorite thing ever was Luca Miranda in an interview was like, "Man, I really screwed up my back doing that shit." <laughs> it's like I was all fearless when I was a young man, but I'm paying for it now. It was awesome. I love him. Uh, now the next logical step: teach. He's gonna burn down the fucking concert. He gets a big old can of gasoline at the the gas station and the gas station attendant hands him a handful of flares Uh oh did i lose you again no i'm still here i just don't okay, know how to God. react to the flares being handed to him it's such a wonderful moment like it's like they they filmed that specific shot like it was very monumental because it looks like dynamite at first and you're like what's he gonna do Right. I guess you ran out of gas. You need road flares while you're filling it up so you don't get ran over is the excuse. But flares and gas <laughs> usually don't mix. And there's no lights at the gas station. It's a secret gas station. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, we're flares only here. It's a uh, very specific niche gas station that only really works with hipsters. Like if you can find mm -hmm. it, then it's already over. Yeah, dude. What is the joke? Um, why did the hipster burn his mouth on the pizza? He ate it before it was cool. <laughs> awesome. i fucking love that joke <laughs> awesome <laughs> i wish i'd made it up uh that i'd be a rich man so he goes to the concert and this is showdown time he's gonna freaking take on damien he's gonna try to do it secretly but of course damien sees him uh pouring gasoline on the uh stage left corner of the stage like he's poured like two cups of gas on the stage he's he doing it for a really long time like right in front of kids that are apparently Just, so into damien oh that they don't God. even notice him it's not until damien sees him that it becomes a problem yeah he's in no hurry to freaking uh kill everyone in that theater <laughs> <laughs> he dumps out like it varying amounts too. like some of the scenes. It looks like it's just about two cups. And then the rest, it looks like he's dumped like half the can on just one part of the stage when, I love you know, it. probably the, the smart money would be to poke a hole into the backside of it and rip the top off and just throw gas all over the band as fast as you can. And then light a flare and hope you die a hero. <laughs> hey, you know? Damien ripped a hole in my backside. <laughs> well, that leather outfit, I can see why. <laughs> Yowza, chafing. So uh, he he manages to get some of his goons or or, or the kids uh, to grab uh, the teach, and then we get the bald reveal where uh, <laughs> freaking Damien rips off his wig and his wig to reveal that he's bald, and he starts turning into a demon, and uh, he turns into the most ridiculous, does not match anything we've seen before monster. Um, this is. He like Damien almost turns into a fucking kaiju. <laughs> like I don't know what this mo this demon form is. It's so adorable. Yeah, it's all over the place, but it's like a hodgepodge of the various forms that we've seen oh earlier. It's like, so great. I think they just ran out of stuff. Like they could have just turned him into the giant articulated monster we saw at the very beginning. Yeah, they don't turn into those guys again, right? I yeah, that must have been shot later. That's the only thing I can think of is that sequence was shot later as an intro because why would you not reuse all those amazing monsters, you know? Like, and they obviously could not refilm this sequence where it's the final showdown. Otherwise, they would be those things, right? Yep. Uh, and then uh, Teach does the one thing that you knew that this is the bane of every heavy metal drummer is he steals the drummer's gong mallet. And starts beating this freaking demon like a gong, like me when someone mentions freaking uh, Sallow. I start banging my gong. Or he's going to town like it's whack-a-mole with the head of a demon. <laughs> and the mole is mutated. <laughs> yeah, it ate its... the other moles. <laughs> yeah. Julie is on stage and she's fully possessed by, by the Damien. And uh, frickin' Teach, like, throws her to safety into the crowd like she was an unwilling stage diver. <laughs> it's so good. 
he checks her like security would if you tried to hop up on stage at a big time fucking show, like right back into the crowd. Like it's yes. nothing. Uh, he lights a flare and all of a sudden he like once now he's burning everyone alive on stage that breaks the spell and all of our hypnotized kids go, oh, dude, I don't like worship the devil. And they all run out in a big panic, leaving freaking uh, the band to quote unquote burn to death. We know they're still out there, but that's a reveal. Oh, and did you notice that he gets a cue to the mayor where he's like, hey, uh, save the kids, let the place burn? Yep. Yeah, and the mayor tells everybody exactly what he just said because we see that the English lit professor really is the person who runs this town. <laughs> oh, he's got some dirt on that mayor, boy. His, <laughs> his, his daughter must have blabbed some shit, like some payoffs are happening. And he's like, you know. <laughs> yeah, he has to. There's something not right about that. <laughs> he's got uh, way too much power and control for an English literature teacher at a high school. Uh, we, we fast forward to we see uh, uh, Teach and the mayor hanging out and they see a news report about um, frickin our pals, uh, Damien and the Black Roses. They're going to play Madison Square Gardens next. So we know that frickin the evil's still out there and they can do nothing to stop it now. They're uh. playing at the old MSG. <laughs> yeah, it's a lifelong dream of Damien's. And it also illustrates that this town was just a test case. He, oh, my Lord. He didn't <laughs> actually win. This was just a way for them to be able to tell. Like they said, it was an experiment that they needed to play five shows to see if it would work. And they tried out the ritual. They perfected it here. And they're going to do Madison Square Garden. So it is Halloween three time now. It's the end of the world by the end of this film, and there's a news report. Yeah. And they're powerless to make it stop. Yep. <laughs> I love that. I still get chills thinking about that when I when the movie's over. I'm like, God damn, and they win, too. That's so fucking metal. So I love it. It's not. It's not anti-heavy metal. It's just pro-evil bands. <laughs> ah, no. It's how this I, movie think, wins. I think it's pro-anti-metal. <laughs> or anti-pro-metal. It could be anti-pro metal or pro-anti metal. It's definitely not propane, which was not good metal. Oh, God. I saw them live, and I, I bought a hat because they were opening for Testament, and, and someone stole my propane hat right after I bought it because the, the, the pit started, and uh, we all got like trampled, my friends and I, and then when I stood up, my propane hat was gone. I looked around for it, and all these scumbag idiots were standing there like with their hands behind their backs looking really suspicious. <laughs> So I was, I was probably lucky they didn't steal my fucking wallet. This was, uh, this is like Fort Lauderdale in the '90s, so you know it's quality fucking Florida bullshit. <laughs> but can you imagine how much worse would it have been if I'd kept that hat? I might have kept listening to Propane, when, like, which was basically a bad Biohazard ripoff. Had some cool solos though. I'll give him that. There were some, there were some cool solos. The guitarist knew what he was doing, other than and, how he shaved God, his head into and, a mullet, but biohazard wasn't even that good <laughs> i'm not gonna like, bag on biohazard but i love that i mean not like not like bad but like can you imagine being a ripoff of biohazard like yeah they aren't big enough to really warrant <laughs> trying to rip off if you're trying to get to a certain level like why rip off a band that's going to be a level that you'll be able to achieve relatively easy like biohazard is oh just themselves that's all they've ever wanted to do is just play music their style they're they're the one band that i would for sure say is like that mm -hmm. Maybe them my and band, like Life of Agony in that same vein. My band is a King Cobra ripoff. <laughs> no, I, don't, I, I definitely couldn't even play half a song by King Cobra. I'd be like, is this like a power chord, bro? <laughs> Diminished so, what? <laughs> exactly. Oh my God, don't even, I can't even learn anything. Before we talk about how we liked or loved this movie, let's talk a little bit about the Glickenhaus, which uh, <laughs> translates to... It's Spanish for Glockenspiel home. Uh, I believe Glocken, Glo or Glickenhaus, the, the gentleman that we're talking about, James Glickenhaus, yes. I believe his last name actually translates into exploitation film. Because <laughs> yeah. this is the name <laughs> that if you are a lover of some of the you finest exploitation films, yep. you will know Glickenhaus. Did he produce Penn and Lauder's Frank Frankenhooker? Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. So Shapiro Glickenhaus Entertainment. Uh -huh. uh, we're talking 
just to name a few, because this is this is 84 titles here. Frankenhooker. Exterminator. Maniac Cop. Maniac Cop, yeah. They should. All definitely make sense. Death Spa, which I still haven't seen. Oh my god, Death Spa is for the Doomed show so much. I, I oh, promise I know. you. I think that's on Jeffrey's in my list at some point. I could totally see that being a Jeffrey film, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes. Uh, a, a John Fasano co-directed joint called Zombie Nightmare. That was an MST3K episode. Oh, uh, basket cases, of course, you know, the multiple basket cases, all the all the frickin. Uh... That's all Hen and Lauder, pretty much. Exactly. I think, I think almost the... every Hen and Lauder film for a good portion of Hen and Lauder's career, Lickin' House produced. Yes, uh, they did uh, frickin Pledge Night. Which is a uh, wild freaking slasher movie. Yeah, I haven't seen speaking that of, in forever. I need to see if I can track that down. Speaking of movies that have people from freaking uh, Anthrax in the movie. <laughs> uh, yeah, do you like this? It's just a great freaking company for your, your schlocky awesomeness. Yeah, and I know Glickenhaus was involved with the Robert McGinty uh, Exterminator. And I believe they did the Exterminator too as well. Um, those are just really mean spirited death wish knockoffs. Like, oh wow! I mean, like severely mean spirited. Oh jeez! Like, like New York Ripper mean spirited death wish ripoffs. Man, <laughs> I love them. I'm just saying. That's amazing. So, uh, let's see. This freaking Black Rose is written by someone named Cindy Surreal. That's how I'm pronouncing it, and it it's a beautiful word. Might be Surreal. Surreal? Surreal? It is very surreal, this movie. <laughs> very Lynchian, and I didn't realize that until you brought exactly. it out. <laughs> um, she also um, frickin' worked on Fasano's other heavy metal horror movie, uh, Rock and Roll Nightmare. She was the first assistant director on Rock and Roll Nightmare. That film which is, the is such, other an movie. such an experience. Oh, my God. That's the other movie I've seen from this dude, uh, Mr. Fasano here, which I didn't see until years and years after I saw the frickin sequel, Another Rock and Roll Nightmare. That's insane. I only ever saw Rock and Roll Nightmare and Zombie Nightmare because of MST3K and Rift Tracks. Back in the day when people still trusted me to review movies and they'd send me free shit, <laughs> I got Intercessor colon another rock and roll nightmare, which um, I don't think John Mickle Thor is even in in other than a, oh, you know, he plays the Intercessor <laughs> <laughs> and he co-produced it. It is pretty dire. It is a, it's a rough movie. It's, um, it has tons of clips from rock and roll nightmare and so many years later i finally got a hold of rock and roll nightmare and i enjoyed it not as much as black roses though i would believe that black roses is certainly the opus of this kind of film for this yeah. gentleman like this is something that and i rock and roll nightmare was before this right yes okay so he definitely perfected and i'm assuming zombie nightmare was probably his first film because it feels like the right kind of progression just from the quality of filmmaking as I've <laughs> just from my memory of what I, what I can remember them being like, it seems like zombie yes. nightmare would be first then. And I'm not looking at IMDb. So you have to tell me if I'm wrong and, and then rock and roll nightmare. And then this film. Yep. So, so the variations on a theme, I think what he wasn't able to do with rock and roll nightmare or what didn't turn out right or what he didn't like about rock and roll nightmare. He fixed in this and he spent a yeah. little more time and they, I, I would assume they had more money. And what they did for rock and well, roll I mean, nightmare and a lot of the 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 puppet and anim- the puppet stuff and the, the the like the creature effects are they were definitely way cheaper than rock and roll nightmare like you could tell he was really like disappointed maybe well you know i'm just i'm speaking for him but i suspect he was probably disappointed so he really made sure the team uh pulled out all the big guns on this one yeah like anything that i would have to say negative towards rock and roll nightmare i would certainly say that it seems like an artist trying to work out frustrated disappointment in a creation and then perfecting it in the next work of art. You know, it's like rock and roll nightmare was a sketch and this is the painting that came from it. Kind Ooh. of, kind of Ooh. thing. <laughs> I, that was very poetic. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. Nice. And that means a lot. I appreciate it. 
things that this film does is so much more than just your average exploitation flick. I mean, they're really trying. There's a whole hell of a lot of heart behind this. And you can really feel it when you're watching it. Like you just, it's like everybody getting together saying, come on, let's put on a show in the backyard. And it just really, everything worked for them. And the only reason I know about this film is it was covered on outside the cinema and they had the same reaction where they just adored it. They totally fell in love with it. And it just became like this big part of their vernacular for the longest time on their show. And so immediately after I heard them talking about it, I went out and bought the DVD. And as much as we warned people not to, you know, (laughs) like to watch it before they hear us talk about it, it still spoils nothing. You could know everything that's going to happen in this film. And you still won't believe what you're seeing the fourth time you're watching it. Trust me. <laughs> when you when you and I were talking about doing this movie and I was like, oh, here's the DVD. I had the, I just knew I was going to enjoy it. So I just freaking bought it. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to rent it. I'm just going to freaking just double down, put my money where my money is and spend it. And I did it. Dude, I, I freaking loved this. This is something I I have a friend uh, who's really into metal, like really into black metal. And he's a librarian. He looks like he would maybe listen to, I don't know, Mumford and Sons, or he would listen to Bell and Sebastian, maybe. Just based on how my friend dresses and, and keeps his hair, he looks like maybe Bell and Sebastian would be too metal for him. <laughs> but no, he is a deep dive. He can He's one of those people that I can identify like black metal by like three seconds of a song. <laughs> he's like the he's, kind of guy that can point out the inaccuracies of metal a headbanger's journey whenever he goes through the sub versions yes like he's the sub genres his, of metal yeah he's gonna push up his glasses and be like well excuse me all oh, his voice is much more pleasant than that but yeah like i want to i my friend jason he needs to see this like i this is the first person i thought of i was like oh man this is for jason yeah and when we were talking about you know metal and you know we got it to talking about horror movies that involved metal because we just kind of started talking about it because of distorted guitars and 80s metal and all of that <laughs> stuff and satanic panic we just kind of got into that the discussion came from us actually talking about various types of pedals and me describing what like one particular pedal sounds like and what they're trying to emulate at one point in time and the sound that I'm looking for is like the late 70s doom metal Tony Iommi's orange amplifiers, real low end distortion and just like real thick, oversaturated distortion sound that I've been trying to look for for like ever. And we were having this discussion about all these different pedals and all these different (laughs) bands. And like I was talking to you and saying like, okay, you know, the distortion on this song that is on that bass Mm -hmm. for Jack Butler, like that sound. That's what I'm looking for. That low end fuzz for the bass. And you're like, oh, my God. Yes, I know. Like, I love that shorthand where you can talk to someone else who's a gearhead and then also someone else who's into music. Like, because I could say that sound to someone else who just loves metal and talk about Jack Butler's bass sound from Cream on one specific song and how that fuzz is like, that's that's metal. That's that's how you make bass metal is that sound. That's all you need. You know, you don't have to go any further than that. When you say that to someone who listens to it and has heard that song and knows metal, they're like, holy shit, you're right. Like, they know it, too. (laughs) It doesn't matter what pedals to them make that happen or how that distortion is made or or what that circuit is or, you know, what that particular type of amp is or whether it was 4x12s or, like, 2x10s or whatever it was that produced that sound. They don't care. They just know that that sound is something that triggers that feeling in them. But well, there's there, there's like a science to it where you're trying to reproduce it, right? Like that's yeah. that's you become obsessed with this one particular sound that makes you feel like that, and that's all you want from what you play is to make other people feel that. Exactly. To put things into perspective, folks. So just just to give you an idea of the kinds of conversations you would have with me if you were into metal or into guitar sounds or very particular guitar tones, I'm telling Court. I found this amazing pedal that was stupid cheap at Sam Ash. I was there goofing off and found out I had store credit I didn't know I had. And there's this distortion pedal on the used table. And I'm like, what is that? Can I play that? And I borrowed it, walked over the other side of the room, plugged it in. And I'm finding this perfect tone for my band. Perfect, right? So didn't I looked up how much it normally costs and went wowsy wow wow. This is a stupid deal. And because of my store credit, boom, I got this cheap freaking pedal. 
And I've been using it ever since. It's been like a, like a couple of years. I've been using just this pedal. I show it to Court. Court goes, oh yeah, that's that's the one where uh, oh, they're trying to emulate Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, um, his particular sound, they yep. dubbed it the brown sound. I think that's like kind <laughs> of a joke that maybe he himself did because that seems yes. like Van Halen's sense of humor. <laughs> Which is perfect it even for says you. Brown sound on the pedal. Which is probably what it attracted you attention wise because you laughed when you saw that. And I knew I know your sense of humor. You're like, I have to own this for that. If it sounds decent, let's do this. I don't even like I know Van Halen. Like I know who they are. And I know like him taking a drill to his guitar and like doing crazy noodling, but I did not know he was the guy who came up with the brown sound joke. And I did not know that this pedal was supposed to be emulating anything other than me wanting this cheap pedal that I'm going to play one one billionth of the notes that he would play. <laughs> like not only not only am I not playing in his style, I'm not even playing the same notes. <laughs> like I'm not even playing notes. What's really... I don't even know what I'm playing ever. What's really on crazy? Guitar. Yeah, what's really crazy about it, though, is that specific pedal that you you got and that you got for like as inexpensive as you did is a very heavily sought after collector item for certain people. It's and, uh, it's by a company named Mad Professor, which um, is a great name. Yeah. And it's they're also they make a lot of really great pedals like there's there's they're really sought after and everything. And I'm not yes. I'm not the kind that advocates like spend so much. I'm like, find something you like the sound of and make it sound good and use that and make it work. That's exactly. That's, that's how I am with, with pedals and everything. But the strange thing that you just happened to stumble across this. And I think the reason that you like the sound of it is when you're turning up, what actually creates the distortion, that's an amp emulator pedal. What's that? What that's trying to do is it's amp. It's emulating the sound of the cranked out amp that Eddie basically (laughs) built himself which yes. is the cornerstone of 80s metal and rock and roll because everyone tried to emulate that sound that he they was couldn't. getting in the finger tapping and everything <laughs> and couldn't quite get that close. And there are entire lines of pedals. There are boutique people who deal specifically only in creating this kind of pedal that you have, like for folks that want that sound so bad. And some of them even have the uh, additional Eddie Van Halen style flanger that you just turn it up and you can create the various sounds. You know, like mm-hmm. like that kind of thing. And I think it's awesome that you recognize the sound of the rock distortion when you're like, that's perfect. That's what I want. You ignore the reverb that's on it. You mess with the tone <laughs> a little bit to get it to the, so- the sound where you like it. But like you get this pedal and you care nothing about anything having to do with Eddie Van Halen or anything other than this sounds like a cranked rock amp and I love it. And that's yes. that's that's exactly what you need. You take something that you like, you take a sound or a tone or a texture in, and you try to put it together and you make this sound because all you're really trying to do is the kind of feeling that people used to get when they would hear Eddie Van Halen's wailing guitar for like even just a chord, that distortion, that overpowered feeling of just that distorted tone, especially in the devil's triad, that feeling that, that, that the hair on the back of your neck standing up because holy fuck, Tony Iommi just played a power chord from hell (laughs) through an orange amplifier. Like whatever the feeling is for you, whatever triggered that feeling, when you feel it, you just know that's it. You know that's the tone. You know that's the sound you like. You know that's what you want to do when you're playing your guitar and then that's what you pick. And I think the obsessive pedal collector is always chasing that dragon. Yeah. (laughs) And, And what did I do? What did I do the day after we had that conversation? You helped me identify what that pedal was supposed to be doing. I ruined it for (laughs) resale value i was like oh shit time to get out the paint markers so i took this hideous brown petal painted it black and i was doing polka dots pink and blue polka dots all over it i dropped the pen on it the sharpie marker on it and the whole ink mechanism came out and ruined my polka dot design (laughs) so then i smeared the paint all over it I used the paint marker to glue glitter to the pedal, and then I typed with a real typewriter, Higgins Engine, which is the last name of the drummer in my band, because he inspires me, and then I like glued that on. So I've completely destroyed any chance of me selling this pedal. That's why I've doubled down 
Like that pedal is staying with me. <laughs> well, and that's what I said too. You're like, hey, maybe I'll paint it now that I know it's an Eddie Van Halen pedal because I don't want to look at that. <laughs> and I was like, you're going to destroy the resale value. And you're pretty much like, fuck the resale value. This I've is done my that pedal. So many times. Uh, you know, do you know the Line 6 DL4? I am familiar it's, with Line 6, but looper. I don't know that. I, okay, okay, a loop pedal. Okay. In 1990, this is the reason I play guitar at all is because of loopers, because I'm a terrible guitar player and will always be terrible. But I saw a band called Don Caballero, and it was right when the other guitarist had quit. So the main guitarist, in order to replace him, bought two loop pedals and based their entire album on looped guitars. That's incredible. So I bought with um, student loan money I was supposed to be like living off of. <laughs> I bought in, in 1999 money, I bought a $300 pedal because Damn. I... This is why I'm still in debt to this day because of <laughs> my student loans. But I bought this $300 pedal and it looped. But the thing with line six is that pedal is still being made the same way 20, over 20 years later. They've never improved the design because I think the guy who came up with it probably doesn't work there anymore. So they just keep putting out the same garbage pedal. I have bought four of these. And the first one was new. The others were all used. Because they break so easily. And what I would do is I would buy it and I would put uh, painter's tape on the buttons and the knobs. And then I would spray paint it. And then as soon as it broke, I would sell it on eBay. And people always buy these things because other people who are smart know how to fix them. <laughs> so that's supposed to be green. I always call it the green machine. But I've sold a black one and I've sold a like a white cream colored one. I sold a hot pink one and I refuse to ever get one of those pedals again. They're still expensive as hell, but they, I also won't buy used ones anymore because after the fourth one broke on me, I realized that I need to find other options for looping. That's crazy. Yeah, <sighs> um, I'm one of those guys because like all my podcasting gear. Um, I purchased because someone else was selling it because it broke on them or it yep. was just old yep. and outdated and they had a hum or a noise. And I went to school for electronics before I became a programmer. Like this was like right out of high school, I got an associate's degree for electronics. So repairing that kind of stuff, I kind of know what I'm doing. And if I can't fix it, then I'll just junk it or, you know, use it for parts or whatever, or give it, right. give it to somebody else or whatever. But I've repaired just about all the equipment that's in my rack. <laughs> now nice. <laughs> like i bought old stuff and a lot of it's vintage and most of it is just because some old engineer was talking about how cool this thing was so i found one that was broke fixed it and played with it just to like hear what they were talking about like nice. just that kind of a, like that equipment obsession and now that's moving on to guitar pedals because i started playing guitar again during my midlife crisis i decided to pick Hell it back yeah. up because i left it down for like ever i bought new amp and i bought a new cabinet and you know i'm Dude. just that's what I'm doing for my, mid my midlife crisis. I'm just going to start playing guitar again <laughs> and buying a lot of pedals. <laughs> that's, man, that's the way to go because it's, it's in the end, it's cheaper than either a mistress or a, a big red sports car. <laughs> and both is definitely way more expensive. True. True. But yeah, dude. And, and also it inspired this episode. Yeah, that, that whole discussion that we just kind of went back over about pedals and all of that kind of stuff, that's just what we're constantly IMing people, like, each other about. Like, <laughs> like I find an EQ pedal I'm excited about that has 10 bands. I'm like, look at this thing. It's going to be awesome, you yep. know? And then <laughs> and I find... I'm like, I'm like, dude, I'm wheeling and dealing on freaking eBay so I can afford the next wave of pedals. Like, it's like, this is the... Uh, the, the guitar pedal shakeup of 2021, because I, I like to go for years, not enough years, unfortunately, but a few years in between selling a bunch of shit and buying a bunch of new shit. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, and I totally like just bought, you know, I'm I'm buying things that are affordable for me, you know, like basically once a month, I give myself the type of money that I would have wasted on. <laughs> Uh, going out to eat or something like that or getting food out you know or something like that i i basically put aside for an entire nice. month and then I'll, I'll spend x amount of money on myself for something whether it's movies or, or whatever and yeah. um so i started doing that with like guitar things and everything so i've just kind of bought this stuff slowly over time you know during the pandemic to kind of keep me from going insane and i started getting back into it but it wasn't until i started talking to you that I got excited about gear. So now my wife is pissed that 
And that tell her I said, you're welcome. <laughs> but I mean, it's not totally your fault because if I'm not doing that, no. then I'm going to buy a Nike, like another Switchblade or a, like another Ooh. Godzilla statue or, or something, you know, <laughs> like my obsessive compulsive nature will need to collect things. At least with pedals, they will have resale value. And maybe if I get the right thing at the right time, like your mad professor, I can sell it for hell a lot more money later. The, the kind of guitar player I am is uh, my band will get on stage and we'll start to set up. And the band members from the other bands will like sense something strange and they'll walk up to the stage and they'll see me unpack my pedal board and they'll get really curious and sometimes take pictures <laughs> because my pedal board is insane. As soon as they see me play, though, they're outside. They're like, OK, let's go. This guy sucks. Aww. No, because I'm terrible. Um, but I <laughs> promised you, I promised you I'd tell you the story of my dad teaching me guitar. Yeah, you held that hostage, that story, Whew. to get me on this show with you. That's right. Here we go. Okay, picture it. Sicily, 1911. Uh, no, so <laughs> I, I was... Um, was that a Golden Girls reference? It totally yes. was, wasn't it? I awesome. think I was, I think I was 11. I might have been 12. Um, I'd saved up my allowance for weeks. And I had $24. And the plan was I was going to go to the comic shop and buy some like back issues of X-Men or something. Because this was the 90s when comic book the comic book industry sucked the donkey balls. <laughs> and any back, even, like a back issue that was like two months old was like $15 because comic book stores were assholes. It was the easiest way to lose your money as a fucking kid in yeah, the 90s dude. to teach you to never play the stock market. Do you know how many comic books from when I was a kid I have? Zero. None. <laughs> yeah, because I couldn't afford them. Um, I, my, my friend, I wrote the my, wave up and sold all of my comics during that time where I had brilliant. a subscription. You're yeah, I had brilliant. Like, yeah, I did a I did a monthly subscription for all certain titles like back in that day. And right as that wave of craziness was happening was when I sold mine off to fund purchases for guitars and stuff. Good job. That was very wise. I traded all my comics for baseball cards and lost all my money because yeah, I'm an idiot. I so believe anyway, that would be a lot of money lost. It was, it was so stupid. Anyway, I had $24. And I was going to do the comic store thing. But then my buddy Christian Underwood uh, spent the night and we were talking about metal. Because he had, he had um, a, a Tampa favorite or just a Palm Beach favorite band called Raped Ape. I know Real the name, name, but I've not, not making heard that them. up. I know the name, but I've not heard the band. Oh, they changed their name to Pain God later. <laughs> Makes sense. Raped Ape was so much better of a name. So he convinced me to buy his acoustic guitar with that $24. And so the deal was made. And as soon as he left, uh, my dad, I showed him the acoustic guitar. My dad's eyes lit up. My dad, I had no idea that my dad even knew how to play guitar at all. This was like secrets. And so he takes the guitar and starts tuning it, right? And Because, of course, he can tune by ear. And then he gets to that high E string. And he starts going, dee, 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 turning that tuning peg. Dee, 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 Hmm. That's weird. He goes, oh, fuck, shit, fuck this fucking guitar. <laughs> he gets really pissed off. It's very awkward, and I'm, I'm so mad at him for breaking my guitar. We go to the store to get one string. <laughs> we, were with, we were that dad and son combination. I've actually seen this happen at guitar stores before. They come in to buy one string to replace a broken string. And I've so, been the son in that combination before. That is so weird. Get me a pack of strings. So we go back home. We get the string on. <laughs> <laughs> My dad starts tuning. Ding, 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 String oh, again. shit, this fucking piece of shit. Hands a guitar to me, like th almost throws it at me and storms out. And that was my dad <laughs> teaching me guitar. <laughs> now, here's the fun story. I had a friend who actually did play guitar, but I never hung out with him. He came over a few weeks later and 
I was like shown him my guitar and I started playing for him. And it, you'd think that like I had opened up my chest to reveal I was an Android because I was showing him how I played guitar and he's looking at me like really confused. Do you want to guess what I was doing? <laughs> Finger tapping? Close. Very, very astute. Since, of course, I'd watched nothing but metal guys play guitar, I was literally resting my right hand, I'm right-handed, on the guitar body, nowhere near the strings, and I was trying to pluck the strings with my left hand, because I'd never realized that people who play guitar were strumming with their right hand. <laughs> oh, wow. Me not know how guitar work. Dude, I'm still doing that. <laughs> no, I literally was taught how to play guitar by my friend who was really into Pearl Jam, and he showed me one thing. He showed me a power chord. It's kind of all and, you need. <laughs> and I've never learned anything else. It's amazing. I rock. I mean, if you're a rhythm guitar player, that's pretty much all you need. Yeah, my my dad was um he was very much he I really get my um my patience my uh my limitless patience with physical objects from him so the things i've smashed over the years in frustration i, I don't know where that comes from oh it's from him <laughs> see wasn't that story worth waiting for <laughs> that's insane he goes all the way buys one string and it breaks on him again <laughs> all you have to do is file the freaking thing if if there's a burr in the nut you just freaking file it bro <laughs> or or in the bridge, I mean, it's, it's just an acoustic guitar, and and I think it's broken because one string's broken. Like I don't know anything about anything, dude. I'm eleven or twelve. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, indifferent parenting. I loved it. It was great. <laughs> That's why I don't have kids because I'm indifferent to even making them. <laughs> <laughs> As we've. As we've seen already in the discussion of the film. Yeah, I ironed off my genitals, remember? <laughs> Ouch. Eh, I've done worse. <laughs> Hopefully to willing participants and or yourself. <laughs> yeah, consent, brother. Yeah, I'm real big about that, like as everyone should be. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Um, did you know that we've managed to record for like two and a half hours? Oh, I'm not surprised. It's the first time recording. We talked a bunch of stuff. And, all and it's at once. been a long, it's been overly long time, sir. <laughs> yeah. We waited way too long, I'm yes. sure. We will not. We will not wait. We're going to be back with, we promise you, trick or treat's going to happen for Halloween. Cause yes, that's a movie I waited way, that just like this one, um, I waited way too long to watch because I could never find anything but like um, a VHS rip of it when I finally found a nice DVD copy of it. I was ecstatic. I'm super stoked for it too. I have a high definition print of it <laughs> under the yep. title of Ragman from overseas. Yep. That's <laughs> the one I found. Yay. <laughs> so folks, if you don't know, and I think I you do because I said at the beginning, but if you weren't listening to me, I don't blame you. Listen to this court has a show called cinema psyops. Him and Matt are killing it. You guys are on episode 300? Or where are you at? As of this recording, I am starting editing on episode 296. That represents Damn, 296 so consecutive weeks of recording <laughs> on or around a Monday and having it out by or around the following Sunday, or maybe That's one day later, nonstop. Amazing. Because <laughs> you know Brad and I, back in the day, we were doing like six months between an episode. Oh, I, I kept like the feed. At our worst. I kept the feed and I kept the faith. And I was I was one of the listeners where you're like, is there anybody that's going to be here when we finally come back a year <laughs> and a half later? <laughs> and I'm looking at my phone going, yes, Richard, I'm here. Yes, Brad, I'm here. Hey, how come your voice sounds different, Brad? What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you not sound like you're on speakerphone going directly into the microphone of a recorder? Oh, my God. Dude, it's great. I really, I really encourage folks to check out Cinema PsyOps. It's freaking awesome. All of your the childhood trauma episodes um, are just brilliant. And it's 
you never know what freaking because I thought I had it bad with ten to midnight, but there are there's way crazier shit <laughs> that people were watching it way too young. Yeah, that is a, a very proud moment of the series. But I realized that I got into the point where I started digging into parts of people's lives, and there were people that were coming on that were sharing things that I just wasn't comfortable myself was sharing like <laughs> like legitimate actual trauma and they were talking oh, about that's so sad but that's the thing about movies is they are a touchstone at this time and we can still tell those stories without focusing so much on the negative aspect of things right. that were traumatizing them but uh yeah it, it got to the point where we were getting shared really emotional moments that i just couldn't handle it anymore <laughs> wow. I, I had to take it away but like a lot of people really dug it and it was supposed to be tongue-in-cheek where it's like i was terrified of this movie because I watched it at six and I shouldn't have seen Nightmare on Elm Street. And it's yeah. more like, you know, you're getting stories of like realizing that your grandmother was a lifelong victim of marital abuse because you're oh. watching a movie with her and that movie triggered that memory. And then you get this realization and like that kind of cinematic trauma was getting shared. And Damn. I was like, I was like, I, I can't, I can't do this. I, I can't. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, you have, I mean, you have your own personal demons to, to deal with. You know, it's like you're not a qualified therapist, <laughs> to my knowledge. Well, that's the part and that so, I'm, that's you know. the part that I'm truly terrified about is that I didn't want people to start getting armchair psychology from someone like me who is completely unqualified. <laughs> Whereas I mean, like, Matt is is fully licensed. Yes, but only in certain <laughs> crab nebula nowhere near <laughs> this planet. Uh, but like, <laughs> <laughs> he's certified in the erotic arts. Yes, yes. Uh, the fuzzy fun times and the dark night times. Yes, that's his that's his thing. <laughs> but like like I really I really was kind of worried about that because there were people that were really starting to share and open up and it was it was really beautiful but at the same time I'm not qualified for that. Like I barely keep my own shit together on most days yes. and realize that I'm a deeply flawed individual. But like I have the luxury of being able to just put it out there and say this is what's wrong with me. And there's nothing wrong with you if this is what's wrong with you. If you like me, if you feel like this, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just living in a fucked up situation. So, like, I'm fine with sharing my stuff and trying yeah. to be, like, you know, giving people that. But, like, I can't tell you what's going to make you happy because I can't right. even figure it out for myself. And that's not what that show is for. Uh, but I, I shifted gears. We ended up doing, um, like... A thing that I called Movie Stack Django, which was literally all of these unwatched Blu-rays that I buy. Because, again, I give myself X amount of money every month that I have that I don't spend on doing other things. Like, most people go out drinking to a, at a bar during normal circumstances once a week with their friends, or they'll go out to lunch, or they'll go out to dinner. Mm -hmm. I avoid everyone and spend all that money that I would have lost going to see them at these restaurants on movies that I watch. Like, yes, and that's, that that's... is also... Yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm there, too. Like, oh... How much is a 12 pack of beer? I'll never know because I bought Kathy's Curse on Blu-ray. <laughs> it costs about the same and you okay. will always have Kathy's Curse <laughs> whereas the beer will be out of you within a matter of minutes if you drink Oh, in it. unless the beer is collectible. <laughs> Fair enough. But like hmm. that that's my thing and that's where the movie stack Jenga thing came from where I was like literally just pull something out of the stack and we did that with guests. And then it just became more and more of a, a, a problem with doing that. So now it's just me and Matt. We're yeah. I'm, I'm looking at doing guests <laughs> once the pandemic ends, because I think I finally found a way to get Skype channel recordings from people that will work and I'll be satisfied because I'm a total fanatic for my sound. That's why my yeah, rack is done the way that it is. I'm obsessed Dude, with it. I've been I've been eyeing your rack for years, bro. <laughs> Thanks for noticing. <laughs> I always leave the curtains open so you can look at my... Uh, <laughs> my audio rack just I'm, a little I'm bit glad, from florida i'm glad the curtains match the ceiling <laughs> you know what i mean well yeah because i painted them of course they do okay <laughs> but you know like I'm, I'm obsessive about it so like I, i'll be getting back to guests and everything but like what we've been basically doing is the movie stack Django format where i just buy what's interesting i just buy what catches my eye and i make matt watch it and then matt and i discuss it but we always have that sort of the worst in armchair psychology where we try to develop or look at character motivations. And I did it a little bit in this movie because it's just my nature where I try to figure out what makes a person decide to do the things that they're doing. How is yeah. the writer, you know, 
telling this part of the story? Is that why their decisions were made? And like, I, I like to look at the psychology of the characters and I love to read way too much into stuff that probably no one else ever thought of. Like no one really cares about the character motivation of people swirling around in a bathtub <laughs> or a hot tub during Madman. But <laughs> well, like, see, I'm gonna over, thing, I'm gonna read too much into it though because I think that's a beautiful moment that needs to be discussed. See, I think these Blu-ray companies need to hit you up for some freaking uh, extras. They need to start having you come in there and drop some of that. I I tell you what, in there, That'd I'll tell incredible. you what, Duder, I would love it. Like anybody, hit me up for that stuff. And depending yep. upon the release, if it's something that I can get behind, like if I can't give you the kind of love that the film deserves, then I will turn the project down. But otherwise, man, I am game. I can talk about anything like that and tell you why I love it. <laughs> here's how professional. Here's how professional I am. I, I like. I wrote to a bunch of companies and was like, "Yo, dog, I want to do your extras." Thanks, bye. <laughs> and I forgot to send like writing samples and like a resume. I just said thanks and sent like a link to my site, like a real pro. And I was like, "Is this why I don't get anywhere?" <laughs> <laughs> is this why speaking of psychology <laughs> like yeah i don't I'm, even I'm, I was send the stuff out upward. so <laughs> i'm worse <laughs> <laughs> hey you never know till you try or do it wrong and then you never know so don't do me like you were talking about like people being relatable that's me but if you relate to me you're sick <laughs> i don't know where i was going with that but dude we're going to have you back, and I want to thank you for being here, and I want to thank Matt for letting you get away just for this night, this hot <laughs> night. I'm just skipping my editing that I normally would be doing this night. It's not dude, a big deal. Dude, I had no... I was going to say something there, and I don't know what it was, but... Oh, well, I just want one last thing to make sure before we completely wrap this up. Please. The Doom Show has a thing where you got a guy. You got a guy for everything. You know, like you need like half price meats. You got a guy. You, you, Do you, we? you need someone to get you some Colby Jack. You got a guy. <laughs> you need you need someone to review movies that verbally accost you the entire time that they're being covered to the point where you're questioning why you even like it. Like a muck train. You got a guy. Mm -hmm. That is that's Jeffrey. Yeah. You know, you you want to talk about Euro horror in a very classic and laid back style. You you got a guy. Yeah. You want Who's to talk. That? You want to talk to a guy about Twin Peaks? I would say Brad with that guy. Yeah, I was going to say Brad. You want to, you want to, you got a guy that you want to talk to about Twin Peaks that uh, is going to give you a perspective completely un American because he's on foreign soil? You got a guy. We got a Simon. And hey, even if you don't want to talk about Twin Peaks, you're going to talk about Twin Peaks because you got a Simon. Yeah, you got a guy. What you need is a satanic panic Here we go. guy. That's what you need. You need a guy that can find you these kind of films that are dealing with the satanic panics. The uh, metal's going to get you. The d and is going to get you like mazes and monsters. And when you're going to cover these, you need a guy. And I think I'm that guy. Is this your audition tape? Kind of. We'll see if people dude, buy into it. Not only will you be my guy, I'll be your guy. <laughs> you got a guy for it now. I'm your dude. guy. Well, we're going to draw up the contracts to get you on this shit some more, so... They're very professional contracts. <laughs> I see that. It looks like you painted them down with PAX paint. And yes, you hand typed labels. Oh, no, that's just your pedals. I'm sorry. That's not a contract. Hey, Why are you handing me this pedal? It, oh, I, I trust me. I have a few I would actually hand you. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's less of a like a, a verbal handshake as it is a verbal man shake. <laughs> I think our wives would have something to say about that, but um, that's also sexual harassment like, to get a job. They'd be like, thanks for the night off, brother. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, before we get too... Uh, uh, we already did, so never mind. Before we continue getting too much, folks, <laughs> thank you for listening. Bye. Bye. Hello, this is The Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other podcasts on legionpodcasts.com. If you'd like more Hello, This is The Doom Show, go to hellodoomshow.podomatic.com or go to doomedmovie.com.